Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, welcome to today's, today's session on visions for wastewater reuse in Bangalore and beyond. Um, we'll be starting off the session with a short video, uh, which explains what we're trying to address today through a series of discussions and presentations, followed by uh, a talk by uh, Dr. Veena Srinivasan. Uh, Dr. Veena Srinivasan is a senior fellow at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, and also the director of the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation. She's a water expert with almost 20 years of experience working with water management in India. As a water researcher, Veena's work has always been interdisciplinary. Her focus has been on solutions that are backed by science and designed for people facing the Indian water crisis. At the CSEI, she's leading the mission to transform scientific research into real world impact by designing solutions that simultaneously create livelihoods and conserve the environment. Veena received her PhD from Stanford and is an alumnus of the IIT, uh, IIT Bombay. Okay, thank you. Living in Bengaluru have witnessed scenes of our lakes foaming. This is happening due to a lack of sewage and effluent treatment capacity in the city. The government has been trying to solve this problem through a decentralized approach. And this has led to almost 2,500 small-scale sewage treatment plants Many discard almost half of the scenes of our lakes foaming. This is happening due to a lack of sewage and effluent treatment capacity in the city. Most of us have the seen government has been trying to solve like this, this problem one. through a decentralized um, and approach. And this Many of us living in Bengaluru have Most of us have seen of lakes of foaming. Bangalore's lakes. This is happening due to one. a lack of sewage. And, and in order, uh, the lakes are the foaming due to a buildup of sewage to solve and effluent in stormwater channels. Approach. And to address this, the government has pushed for a decentralized approach to sewage treatment in the city. And as a result, we have over 2,500 decentralized sewage treatment plants, with the majority of them concentrated in apartment buildings. So first, let's deep dive into how water flows within an apartment. Water from the apartment complex is used for things, uh, uh, first comes from piped water and bore wells, and is used for domestic activities, and then goes to the STP, which is located within the apartment. Complex where, it itself, is recycled. where it's recycled. Some of this water is consumed directly Half of this water is used in the apartment for complex like for things like toilet landscape. flushing and landscaping. But, most apartments but find that despite efforts by residents, almost 50% is, is discarded into stormwater channels, stormwater channels which then finds its way to lakes, which causes causing an pollution. Build up of nutrients and negatively and impacts in order to address health. this, what we're having this session today, today to discuss what the potential solutions could be. Green, they could be using wastewater for greening outside the apartment spaces, places, or also blue, for recharging lakes, for and recharging lakes and aquifers, and also and yellow, industry and construction activities. Water for construction and industry. Thanks, Shreya. And also apologies for the uh, people who are online and in person, because thanks to Bangalore's lakes, uh, the whole city becoming a lake, I think a lot of people haven't been able to get cabs and come here on time. So we had to start uh, a little later because of that. So what I'm going to start off, kick, kick us off uh, talking about today is just a series of questions uh, that we have encountered in, being, in having to manage uh, Bangalore's water. So uh, basically, we've, we've kind of all seen that um, apologies. OK. Can you go back? Yeah. So we, so we, we so the main thing is that Bangalore's water system is incredibly is incredibly complex. Um, and uh, uh, we basically start off with we have we have rain, uh, which recharges aquifers through lakes as well as the very shrinking green spaces in Bangalore. Um, 
and then of course we understand that for a city like bangalore a very significant component of the of the water comes from outside the city from the kaveri um the kaveri water is treated and supplied through uh, pipelines and then additionally people get water from private boreholes and tankers as well um the central part of bangalore is um, uh, supplied through public infrastructure by the bangalore water supply and sewerage board uh, but a large fraction of this is actually uh, lost an estimated 35% is lost uh, and and we think recharges groundwater we don't know where the losses go um and then we have both commercial industrial and construction activity and there's actually uh, not a good sense of exactly how much is being used by each of these sectors uh, and then there's a wastewater treatment capacity which we understand is often um uh is is changing over time but the centralized sewage treatment plants are designed for large capacities so uh so that uh so 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 the challenge then is that they are located often uh in the outskirts of the city now for those who know bangalore bangalore is at the at the top of um uh of a of a hill and so that means the water is flowing downstream which means that on reuse within the city becomes a challenge uh what's happening now so of course there are as priya as uh, shreya pointed out over 2500 uh, decentralized wastewater treatment plants and we don't know what's happening to the quality or the output of these decentralized treatment wastewater treatment plants we do realize that not all of it is re uh, reused on site um some of it is reused we don't know what happens to the rest of it then of course we've been watching bangalore's monsoon runoff uh, over the last few few days and we've been privileged to maybe be under it in 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 some cases but we don't know where each of these components of exactly why the monsoon runoff is accumulating in certain places and to what extent wastewater being in the cities being released into the cities lakes is exacerbating the fact that we have no room for the rain so once you have all of your water bodies filled with treated or untreated wastewater what happens when the rain then uh, comes in uh, and then of course we've seen this issue of increasing uh, or increasing uh, paved spaces and leading to greater runoffs and urban floods uh, and of course one of the things you might have observed if you're from not from india is that not all of our uh, roads have storm water drains so not surprisingly uh, this is a problem um and then of course there's a large amount of evapotranspiration we don't have any estimates of uh of of how much is okay so we don't have a, a, an estimate of how much um uh, uh, how, how much uh, how how much we don't have an estimate of how much total evaporation and evapotranspiration is both from lakes as well as from the green spaces so i'm going to stop there and 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 i think our next speaker shreya is priyanka so i'm going to hand to shreya thank you veena for giving us an over, overview of the urban water cycle uh, our next speaker is dr priyanka jamwal who works at the interface of science and policy and is a senior fellow at atri um her focus areas are identifying um effective ways uh, to, uh, to look at uh, wastewater quality that can lead to effective policy making her interest lies in understanding the fate and transport of contaminants in hydrological systems and understanding factors responsible for the sustainability of nature based solutions she closely works with all state and non state actors to identify the interdisciplinary nature of problems and develop solutions suitable to the local communities over to you priya thank you shreya and good morning everyone uh, so uh, today i'll uh, just walk you through the kind of work we have been doing at water and a society program at atri and it is with close collaboration with csei we have been looking at various uh, issues related to water quality so um, uh, water and society program in collaboration with csei has been working in both rural and urban scapes our focus uh, is to do actionable research where the uh, the objective is uh, to um, to make sure that the resources which are present in these 
to in these uh, landscapes are put to right use. So I will give you an example, or I'll, I'll illustrate this by uh, taking an example of our engagement with lakes and wastewater in Bengaluru. So I think uh, it's, it's okay. Sorry. I'm sorry for this, but there is some lag. Okay. Okay. So um, historically, if we go back um, in history, Bangalore was known as city of thousand lakes. And these lakes were cascading into each other and they were basically used, used to carry fresh water, which was used for drinking water purposes and for irrigation purposes. But as city grew, these lakes now receive uh, untreated wastewater, both industrial and domestic. And as a result, we see um, lakes catching fire, Belandur being one of the examples, and also foaming in most of the lakes, foaming and frothing in, uh, in several lakes across, across Bangalore. So then the, uh, like, you know, so, uh, especially coming to Belandur Lake example, where the lake caught fire and it has like, you know, a foaming, uh, very frequent foaming. So then the question uh, people started asking was that what is causing this foaming and fire in the lake? So there was a common consensus, consensus which was building up around that it is mostly industrial effluents which are discharging some contaminants and which is causing fire. And there, then there was strong lobbying to close factories and industries which were in the catchment. But before this, all this started, we, we thought that it would be interesting to first identify what is leading to this problem. Like, because uh, it was not well established through monitoring that what is causing fire in Melandur Lake or what is causing this foaming. So we started monitoring, rigorous monitoring at Belandur Lake. We, we quantified and qualify, uh, uh, we basically measured water quality characteristics and also quantify how much uh, contaminant load is coming into the lake. And we also took uh, water, uh, uh, dissolved gas samples and um, uh, other gas samples from like, you know, atmospheric gas samples from both Belandur and Jakpur Lake to find out what is the real cause of, of fire and foaming in the lake. And what we found uh, was that industries were partly to blame or basically they were not even causing any pollution. It was the historical built up of sediments uh, of the dis sewers discharge into the lake because there was so much built up of, uh, of sediments in Belandur Lake. It has led to anaerobic conditions and there were certain ambient conditions which led to um, formation of methane gas. And then these studies were like, you know, because people wanted to know what has caused this fire and foaming. So the outcome of the work was also published in common, uh, in common media. So, so we reached out to people uh, on, uh, on like, you know, um, these, the, like basically telling what is the reason for foaming and frothing. So, so frothing also, it was basically not being caused by, uh, by industrial effluents. It was basically, again, coming back to the sediments, when they, you have a lot of organic sediments, there are certain kind of filamentous bacteria which grows and it makes foam very, very stable, which like, you know, it's very difficult uh, to, um, to, uh, to um, remove. So, <clears throat> so once uh, we established, we did the monitoring, we established like, you know, what is the baseline, then we started looking at uh, uh, doing the modeling and diagnosis we started looking at various scenarios which would lead to better outcome in terms of lake health. So we worked, we, and, and then we started working with our partners, um, uh, Biome, Common Studio, to find out solutions uh, which are economically viable and can lead to improvement in water quality. And uh, the findings from, uh, from this work was also, uh, was also published a, in outreach media, we also created Lake Vision uh, um, uh, documents. So the outcomes were, were basically communicated to all the key stakeholders. And then the final step was how do we integrate all this into policy and practice? So, so then the next exercise was we, we sat with the key stakeholders, with lake groups, and we identified what are the goals for, for, for lake, what are the restoration goals? 
And in addition to this, we also created lake dashboard and the water quality data was published online so that stakeholders can make informed decisions. And once the, once the, um, the goals were decided on what the goals, um, uh, goals are, then we, we, we got to think that, okay, if we have to address the water quality issues in lake, we need to address sewage problem. And then the question was, how do we value wastewater so that it can it is treated and reused? So then, of course, with CSCI, we started these three campaigns, green to gray, uh, gray to green, where we looked at the options of how treated effluent can be used for greening. Uh, for uh, greening. Then the second is gray to blue, where how we can use treated effluent to recharge, uh, to fill in lakes, which can finally, which can ultimately recharge our groundwater. And the third campaign, gray to yellow, where how we can uh, create market about, uh, around using treated effluent for construction. So this is just a part of like, you know, and of course we collaborate with various partners who are working on different dimensions of wastewater treatment and reuse to make these things to happen. So, yeah, so this is just a glimpse of a part of what the kind of work we are doing in collaboration with CSEI. And um, like, you know, if you want to know more, we can chat during tea or during, at, at the lunch. Thank you, Shreya. Thank you so much, uh, Priyanka. And now moving over to our Swiss collaborators who have um, um, come specifically for these interactions that we're having now. Um, I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr. Bernard Truffer, who's the head of uh, the Department of Environmental and Social Sciences at AWAC. Uh, Dr. Truffer is a professor at the University of Utrecht, a uh, faculty of geosciences, and is a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Research Policy. His research interests include technological innovation systems and industry dynamics, geography of transitions, tr sustainable transformation of infrastructure sectors, and his research and publications have won several awards and distinctions. He holds a PhD from the University of Fribourg <laughs> in Switzerland, in 19, uh, which he uh, got in 1993 in economic geography. Over to you, Bernard. Thanks, Rayan. And uh, welcome everybody and uh, good morning. And we're very pleased to be here. So for me, it's the first time in India even, and to be so generously hosted here by the Institute and we had already lots of inspiring discussions. So I guess my contribution now is uh, to introduce you to a joint project that we uh, have been setting up or trying to set up over the last two years, mostly by Zoom. And now we want to get serious and uh, hopefully started by the beginning of next year. And to, I would just want to give you some background on who we are and what sort of competencies we contribute. Sorry, I was the wrong direction. So AMARC is a Swiss uh, research institute, a federal research institute, which is part of the ETH domain, as it's called. But it's an independent research institute um, that focuses uh, almost entirely on water uh, research. We have about 500 staff which uh, we have 150 PhD students and about 100 postdocs. So half of the Institute is just uh, circulating very quickly. Um, we have uh, departments on water chemistry, on biology, engineering, and also on social. That's where I'm uh, also located at. Um, and within EAVAC, we have a sort of a cross-departmental research program already in more than 20 years, um, where it's on uh, possible solutions for more decentral and more modular approach to urban water management. And I will explain in a moment why. Um, yes, and this has been jointly running by between the uh, engineering and the social science departments to really get a sort of an understanding, let's say, of the technology and the operation system and the regulatory context to really have a systemic understanding of what it takes to uh, make these systems run reliably, etc. Um, so we have had major research activities uh, since more than 20 years, and one of the remarkable elements or infrastructures is that we have this uh, water hub or nest uh, uh, experimental site, which is a building platform where you can have this sort of, uh, does it work? Oh, sorry. Um, where you have these sort of containers, uh, which can be sort of individually, almost independent sort of uh, living structures with um, uh, multiple plumbics, uh, pipelines to go down in the cellar where the water is treated and which is, can really be used as an experimental site for new technologies and so on. 
Um, we run a, a plethora of projects, uh, especially also in Switzerland. Um, how, what the role of decentralized technologies could be in the urban water management sector in Switzerland and how we could get there. And then, but also um, lighthouse projects in the US, in Australia, India, China. Um, so just to say we have a footing in Switzerland, but actually our research focus has really a global dimension and a global outreach. And so, sorry. you have to push the buttons <laughs> then it works <laughs> i'm not good at pushing buttons um so no sorry that's i won't guys it's kids okay yeah let's so uh, so the, the project that we jointly want to run with csi and a3 is uh, sort of um uh, based on this understanding how to transform urban water management toward the uh, a few, uh, more sustainable future, so to speak. And let's say we had these pictures of foaming rivers and lakes uh, in the 70s in Switzerland. Then we set up, and Eva was very important in that, to have a national program for centralized uh, treatment of wastewater. Now we have solved all of, the, of these problems, or most of these problems, and uh, we have connection rates uh, for the households of over 97%. And so you could say, say, ah, you're a happy country, everything works perfectly. Why are you interested even in, in decentralized solutions? And uh, this is the point that we have seen already uh, since like, more than 20 years ago to say, well, this system works under uh, certain conditions at a certain price, but it's perhaps not the, the standard, the gold standard for the rest of the world, especially if we see, um, yes. The, um, the situation in the world, across the world, we see that connection rates are, are much lower in many places and then, you know, the, the systems don't operate appropriately. And also, if we think about future challenges in Switzerland, it's perhaps not the best way to, to just continue on decentralized, to, but to move rather to sort of hybrid solutions or, you know, giving the, the centralized, a decentralized and modular uh, approaches a sort of a fair chance in the system and to, to improve the overall situation. So we have started these uh, activities about the mainstreaming of decentralized and hybrid forms of water use and treatment. And we see um, first uh, um, products on the market, like here you have a sort of a, a unit for gray water treatment that was developed in the Netherlands that's available on the market. We have uh, such technologies as upfall showers, recycling showers where the water is reused, uh, but we don't have any sort of integrated System, well, we have few, but you know, we are still far from mainstreaming this sort of option. And so, in our analysis, you know, really on the, from a global level, we found out that Bangalore is one of the most interesting places um, for these new technologies to take shape. It's not to say that all the problems have been solved in Bangalore and we just have to copy, but it's sort of like the test bed where these things really have a chance to get developed over the years. So, um, the project that we want to get uh, to make to, to do together. Uh, wants to identify functional cost-effective systems and their scaling potential from what we see here, but perhaps also we can jointly discuss um, how feasible uh, uh, strategies could look like. And we want to see, analyze this from a technology point of view. That's uh, my colleague, Eberhard Morgenroth, who will talk more about that, but also including issues of acceptance of business models and of regulatory fit. And so that's why we have this sort of interdisciplinary um, setup but also, you know, we're very aware that making these sort of technologies work, we, we rely on the practitioners in the field because they know really what's happening. And you know what, when we develop something in the lab, this doesn't mean that it will uh, really function in, in reality. So it's, it's really the, this, the kind of gathering we have here is very important for running the project. So for the empirical focus, so we, you know, we looked, uh, we, we discussed a lot over the two years, you know, what would be a, a good way to delimit it. And we, we now decided to um, focus on sort of visioning of alternative system configurations that have a high scaling up potential that are perhaps also quite innovative and have lots of open issues. We don't know yet whether they will be the ultimate best solution, but that have a, a big potential to, um, to develop. And so we, we settled down for now, but you know, that's also a matter of discussion at our uh, site visit now. Had to focus on two sort of um, types of, uh, of systems. Uh, the first one, I, I would call them, they, they uh, aim for water autarky. 
And these are sort of um, treatment system, for instance, for RWAs that aim at, uh, at treating water to a high level and let's say make it almost uh, 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 independent of uh, outside water uh, contribution. And a second one to have uh, a water production aim, which means uh, to, to use a treated wastewater as a source and you know, apply it to the, uh, the, the yellow, uh, uh, the green, blue and yellow sort of uses of treated wastewater. Let me just finish with a slide. Yes. Um, so we have uh, like five work packages, that's a technical term, but essentially we have a first work package where uh, Ebron Morgan wrote and uh, uh, Eva Linert will, um, uh, Reinhardt will, uh, will work on technology questions and quali water quality questions. We have a, a second group that will uh, talk about uh, user accessibility, legitimacy and trust, so how can we convince end users about, or you know, how is their attitude in the first place? towards these sort of different water qualities, et cetera. Uh, we have a, a, another research part that is about business models, standardization and upscaling. Uh, the three representatives are here in the, in the room for that. And um, uh, another uh, last team about the regulatory context, um, which had already worked for uh, quite a number of years in India and in particular also in Bangalore. So we can build also on their, their work. But then of course we will have some synthesis and follow-up activities. Last point, um, our next step. So we will um, submit the funding request uh, by the end of September, and we're very confident that we will get the funding so we can start um, uh, in January, 2023. And uh, the duration will, for a first uh, period, will be over two years. And then we hope that based on the, the insights we gain there, we might then engage in a longer term uh, project. Thanks a lot for your attention. I hand over back to Shreya. Thank you so much, Bernard, for the overview of what we're going to be doing. Uh, just wanted to give you a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Eberhard Morgenroth. Morgenroth, is that right? <laughs> um, Eberhard is a professor for process engineering in urban water management and is the head of the process engineering department at AWAC. Um, and he has appointments both at ETH Zurich and at AIRAC. His research interests include wastewater treatment, membrane bioreactors for water reuse, control of biofilms, biofilm reactors, biological drinking water treatment, decentralized wastewater treatment, and energy recovery from wastewater and organic residuals. He's an editor for water research and for water science and technology. He holds a MS in, from the University of California and a um, a, a diploma in engineering from the Technical University of Hamburg. He also has a PhD from the Technical University of Munich, all in civil and environmental engineering. Over to you, Eberhard. Thank you very much, Shreya. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to, to link into what Bernhard was uh, talking about. So he introduced the basic concept uh, of this project. And part of, the co of this project uh, is about technology. I realize another part of the project also is about the non-technological aspects, innovation, companies, business innovation. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the event today, and I'm very much looking forward to the uh, event uh, for these two years that we will be working with each other. Uh, and rather than telling you what the solutions are, I would really like to start out with some questions or hypotheses. Uh, well, the hypothesis is that we should really use the most simple and cheap and robust technology. But the most simple, cheap and robust technology that's suitable for the task. And I think this is when it gets interesting because the tasks that we've outlined here are not simply uh, meeting some government regulation uh, and not worrying about it, but it's really looking at it from a different perspective. So the desirable reuse on site uh, and also a secondary market. And so related to this, uh, keep it simple uh, approach. I have really three questions that I get all the time when, when it comes to thinking of technology innovation. So question number one, 
Membranes, I mean, they're too complicated and costly, right? I mean, water, who wants wastewater? What's the value of water? And then the third question, uh, online monitoring isn't, I mean, that's nice, but it's too expensive, right? And so I, I want to use these three questions to uh, relate to a project that we have done where the lessons from that project that we have done may be relevant also for what we're talking about uh, today. So what you're seeing here is an example of water reuse. This is not in Switzerland, this is in San Francisco, uh, where in downtown San Francisco, there is not the requirement to do water reuse. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the building. On the right-hand side, you see the basement. Uh, so this is what I would call the gold standard for water reuse that they have in California. And it's basically a little factory. So it is a membrane bioreactor. And what I see here is for me very exciting as a process engineer, but I would also see here, uh, there's a lot of uh, sensors, chemicals, uh, advanced treatment. So you need a chemical engineer on site here. So maybe this is too complicated for practical implementation. Uh, and and when, I, when I talk to the operator there also, that's what I see, that the operator is not trained for it. The technology that you have um, and the, the operator's expertise are really diverging. And so the question is, maybe the answer is membranes are too expensive and they're too complicated. Well, um, here's our approach to this. So we spend quite a bit of time using membranes in a way that they get very simple. So no chemical cleaning, no shear, uh, no backwashing, no sensors, no, no really operation. And so what you see on the right-hand side is a project uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, looking at water reuse in an in a, a urban slum environment. And that needs to be simple. And so you see on the right-hand side, you see a toilet, and then, then you see a membrane bioreactor running all by itself uh, back here in this system. And the, the membrane just gets dirty over time, uh, but we understand it sufficiently well that we can run it without uh, intervention by an operator for let's say a year or so. So the problem is not the membrane, the problem is the way that it was introduced in the previous slide, which is basically taking a very large plant and simply making it smaller as opposed to thinking about what's appropriate for a certain uh, situation. So this is now this water treatment technology where the, the membrane itself can be done in a sustainable way. Uh, this is what you see here is a hand washing station that simply continuously recycles water on site, uh, as you can see here. To make this successful, uh, you don't only need technology, but you need a business model that works. And so when I'm thinking of technology, I'm thinking not of technology. I'm not the one inventing technology. It's really the people that do the business model. So what Bernard talked about to, to define the demands that we have to address. And so I think it's also in this project, you're really understanding the demands and then developing technology rather than we have a solution and then let's see how, how Bernard can sell it uh, further on. I'm not gonna explain the slide to you, uh, but what the slide is showing you is water quality in the water reuse that we're doing in this hand washing station in Durban, South Africa. By the way, it's also Eva who's here in the audience who uh, um, uh, provided uh, input into this. So what I, what, what I would like to show to you, uh, this is water quality. Uh, the quality that we have here is about one or two orders of magnitude cleaner than the drinking water that we have uh, in Switzerland. And it's also one or two orders of magnitude cleaner than the drinking water that you have in bottled water that you would be buying here. We're talking about an urban slum, but the, the, we, to be able to have a business model that works, we need people that really want this water. So we have to have a quality uh, that people say, yes, it's not just second class, and hopefully we soon have a better solution but we've made it. We now have something that we, that we can use reliably uh, as a water source for, for, um, for hand washing in this case. So we should really not think about meeting regulations from government and trying to avoid meeting these regulations, but think of the product. What do people want? And this is again also what our project is about. 
And then the last aspect is the question of sensors. So when, when we went into this urban slum environment, uh, we were faced with a question and the question was, well, how do you know that the quality of the water today is good? And we said, well, we measured it yesterday and we know what we're doing. And they said, no, 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 we want to have quality control. So it's not uh, some fancy research institute saying, oh, we want to do online measurements, where can we apply this? It's really a demand from the customer who wants to make sure that this is safe. And so we are now working on developing sensors for doing just that. The problem is having a sensor telling you, oh, the system is not working, is not, not uh, sufficient for, for a good model. And so what it really takes, and now I'm looking at all of the, the entrepreneurs here, uh, it needs an environment where somebody cares about what the sensor is saying and has a way of then making things work. So the customer um, knows that the money goes into not just having a green or a red light, but goes, uh, knows that the money goes into finding a solution to having reliable water. If I have an, a, live in an apartment complex and I trust that I have safe water throughout because there is a company that really makes money uh, not on installing, but on providing good service, uh, this is really the idea. And to take it from, uh, from um, uh, Durban, South Africa, uh, to here, this is a picture taken maybe four days ago uh, in one of the STPs here, where we are now trying to use the same approach to get a better understanding of quality and, and help uh, uh, provide a product uh, here that is desirable also for the, uh, the people that are living in these apartment complexes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Before you leave, we'd just like to give you a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> um, next, we have uh, Dr. Rohini Balasubramaniam joining us uh, virtually. She's the nodal op officer for, the, uh, for NCAP at the BBMP. Uh, Dr. Rohini is an independent consultant based in Bangalore, and she specializes in environment and climate change. Her areas of expertise include sustainable transport solutions, climate finance, green bonds, greenhouse gas emission reduction mechanisms, and sustainable development of urban agglomerations. She has the experience of working across geographies such as South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, as well as Korea and Egypt. She has successfully executed several domestic and international developmental projects in areas such as transport planning, railway and multinodal logistics, travel demand analysis and modeling and traffic revenue forecasting. Dr. Rooney today is going to talk to us about the links of wastewater to climate change. Um, over to you, Dr. Rooney. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks so much for this invite. Um, it's really a pleasure um, to be uh, talking in this forum on water and um, also very relevant when we are seeing the city of Bengaluru um, struggling with the kind of water uh, lash um, that is happening because of the nature's fury. Um, let me get straight to the subject and I'm going to keep it extremely short um, due to other commitments for the day. Um, we all know that uh, GHG emissions um, are uh, there from uh, municipal wastewater treatment. And we also know that uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, contribute to a lot of water pollution. So what is important is um, how, do we, how do we map resource consumption and uh, how are we going to uh, map the environmental impacts, especially the greenhouse gas emissions? So uh, fundamentally, it's important that we need to mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions of wastewater treatment plants. And uh, that will possibly help us to achieve carbon neutrality or uh, possibly uh, trying to achieve a carbon uh, net zero pathway for India um, you know, come in the coming years up to 2060 or 2070. But uh, having been in this, um, in this field for quite some time, the challenges that we face are lack of uh, GHG inventories. Now, uh, when we look at the emission inventory for wastewater treatment plants, 
is basically for methane, N2O, and CO2 emissions. Now, the GHG emissions from wastewater contribute only uh, very little, of course, to the global uh, anthropogenic GHG emissions, but it is still extremely important that we map the GHG emissions and we set targets to mitigate this uh, emissions. Now, when we look at uh, many of the studies, the emission factors that we rely on are the IPCC factors, and um, you know they lack the um, regional level uh, emission factors. Now, um, uh, I think the project that uh, um, you know Shreya and Atri are looking at is looking at mapping these um, kind of wastewater treatment plant uh, GHG emissions. And uh, you know, uh, they are looking at how we can control it, how there can be reuse of water with very less greenhouse gas emissions that are going to be contributing at a city level. So um, from the uh, municipal corporation side and from an individual point of view, uh, I welcome this project and we would love to work with it and take this forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rohini. Thanks for making the time. Um, I'd now like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar, who was the former technical advisor to the uh, Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board of Karnataka. He is currently the chairman of Green Lantern Engineering. He's a renowned expert in environmental and in the environmental engineering sector and has acquired his doctor de doctorate degree from Vishveshwaraya Technological University and currently heads the water and wastewater management wing of Green Lantern Engineering. He has over 30 years of experience in the field of water and wastewater, as well as biomedical waste management in both private and government sectors. Today, Dr. Ravi Shankar will be giving us an overview of how the policy and mandate came into place and what has happened in the city post that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Ravi Shankar, as she introduced. Uh, with a limited time, whatever you have given. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. And good. Uh, I am sharing my experience of uh, last 40 years in the water and wastewater management in India, uh, mainly Bangalore. Uh, I worked in most of the municipal sewage treatment plants of Bangalore. Uh, I, I worked almost 30 years. I, I, I had a lot of experience in success as well as in failures. Uh, success, we had to copy. Failures, we had to learn. Uh, we have seen different uh, technologies introduced uh, in Bangalore. Of these technologies, sorry, several technologies are available as the previous speakers were telling. Uh, one, uh, what's up? Balasubramanyam, the previous speaker, she was telling the methane gas emissions, methane gas, greenhouse gas emissions from the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, I have a small case study where we have 150 KLD capacity, just 150 KLD capacity uh, sewage treatment plant of a school where it produced 30 cubic meters of biogas, 30 cubic meters of biogas for 150 KLD. Uh, in Bangalore, we can imagine there is around 1,500 uh, MLD, million liters of wastewater treatment, uh, treatment plants already existing. Another 1,500 is already under uh, various stages of commission. Just imagine 150 KLD can give you, KLD can give you around 30 cubic meters of biogas per day. Imagine 1,500 million liters plus another 1,500 million liters is being added uh, in Bangalore. So as you know, methane, is 22.5 times more powerful greenhouse gas compared to the carbon dioxide. Any municipal treatment plant, when you remove the pollution, it is in the form of carbon dioxide or methane or both. It is a, that's what it happens. Now, if we have a will, there is a way. If you have to address climate change, as you say, even in primary schools only we speak, little drops of water make a mighty ocean like that. If we have addressed this methane mitigation, from the wastewater treatment, uh, it is also possible to address the greenhouse gas emission and will be addressed in the uh, climate change, what we are seeing all these years. This is a small case study I'm telling you, which multiply this something, something miracles can happen. Now, similarly, 
another case study we have where food waste management is also important in an apartment complex like a municipal complex food waste also comes right what are the food waste is also biodegradable if you don't treat it properly naturally it methane gas emission but now anaerobic decomposition gives methane gas again it's a greenhouse gas so should we not address that also if we don't say majority of the developing countries we dispose the food waste or biodegradable waste directly into the environment without proper treatment which also gives lot of methane gas emission so how is it not possible to treat that is it uh, uh, very difficult to treat actually we have small case studies there also uh, where what we do see in, when you flush the toilet when you flush the toilet water with our fecal matter will become sewage now similar and we can treat it with anaerobic technology uh, and we get methane or biogas from that and we can use it for various uh, end users similarly food waste can also be grinded with water and make it into a liquid waste and it can be treated similar to sewage treatment plants again you get biogas from that also it has got lots of advantages lots of advantages is you are uh, getting a by product as which has got methane which has got a calorific value we can use it for any various end users you can directly use it in a kitchen you can generate power you can convert it into lpg you can convert it into png so many options are available where there is a will there is a way we have to attempt so this is what uh, we are not attempting in a sustainable models now there are technologies what is available in abroad uh, like one example they were telling membrane bioreactor uh, how many membrane bioreactors we have actually in india the major membrane bioreactor came in bangalore only such technologies are really sustainable only when you sell that water and make money out of that one for example we have uh, in kabban park there is a municipal treatment plant of a membrane bioreactor where that water is being sold to uh, vidana sauda and then kabban park and then race course i like that so where there is money we can have of in developing countries especially when you can money there is it's always possible to make revenue out of that one and when you have revenue those models will sustain if you have a for example there is a small taluka headquarters where waste water is generated they don't have money to pay power charges itself so how can you such sustain technology it will not be a sustainable one for india but where it is sustainable where you can sell that water where you can make money and it's a very very profitable venture actually membrane bioreactor is extraordinarily good one uh, where we have a lot of power lot of skilled maintenance lot of capital cost so all these things will be it is will be on the case to case study you cannot just copy and paste whatever is in germany whatever is in america if you just put it here it will not sustain we, we have uh, there are sustainable technologies is the order of the day we have to find a proper solution to either liquid waste or biodegradable solid waste see non biodegradable solid waste is always easy because it, in india most of it is recycled biodegradable solid waste and liquid waste are biodegradable sewage both are these things where we can we have to address very sincerely and get by products out of that one last but one with the limited time what she has given i would like to mention that consider waste management as an industry both liquid waste and solid waste okay liquid waste as you told you as the uh, previous presenter was telling after treatment the liquid waste what is the end product is the treated water okay treated water has a got a monetary value in one of my experience in bangalore international airport present international airport what you are seeing is all constructed with recycled water only i did that project in 2002 uh, where the water was taken from elhanka municipal treatment municipal waste water from elhanka and we had a tertiary treatment plant and then we laid a pay from from elhanka to international airport at, during construction time even the runways were also constructed with recycled water now we sold what water, water at 25 rupees per kl 25 rupees per kl and bangalore water supply and sewage board is making quite huge money by selling the recycled water okay it is a sustainable model because we it, it took the technology from trench and that even today that plant is working government is making money out of that one now then, like with this example what we have to learn in the consider it as an industry entire india or entire world should consider this as an industry 
what is the logic here the logic is what is the waste should we pay for that sewage should be pay it comes free sewage is free raw material is free correct what is the end product treated water treated water has got a demand now when you treat the sewage what is the by product to get sludge is it not so sludge is also used as manure we can use it as manure farmers can take that as a manure now when you treat the sludge you get a by product that is biogas is it not you get biogas so by products by product also has got a demand what is that you have to learn from here show me one industry in the earth where raw material is free raw material is reliable end product has a demand by product has a demand by products by product that is biogas also has got a demand so still we are not able to do logic is correct are we doing justice we are not doing just why because we are not following the sustainable models sustainable models is important sustainable models means you should be useful useful to the society and you should address to the society's concerns for example you are putting a municipal treatment plant in middle of a community which produces lot of odor lot of noise will people accept they will close it because they want to the everybody has got a right so when you do a planning of the any waste management facility you have to have some system boundary conditions what are the system boundary conditions now nobody wants to see sewage during process of treatment i also don't like to see sewage so you have to design a plant such that waste water should not be seen or waste should not be seen during process of treatment it's possible to do well there is a way man can go to moon is it not possible to do like that it's possible to do we have done that there is case study so like that waste water should not be seen then water water is nobody likes to have any bad water so it is not possible to treat the odor so many technologies are available see that odor is also treated nice nice is also an important thing pollution control board standards is less than 80 or 90 decibels so you have to design the system where there is no noise so uh, the aesthetics aesthetics is very important when vidhan sabha can be built so like that why not a municipal treatment plant should be built like that it's possible to do so these system boundary conditions if you follow any waste management facility will become an asset otherwise it becomes a liability so if there is a will there is a way so there are successful case studies which are not uh, reflected in the media uh, are the people uh, we see always failures uh, last but one least if you have another three four minute huh? okay uh, this is about the wealth and waste okay waste from wealth it's possible to if you have a will there is a way now coming to if somebody is there is there any from government of karnataka this side and that is hmm? online people are there good there are floods are happening in bangalore and the entire world is uh, uh, looking at bangalore seeing the cars floating people moving in the boats is it not from the apartments flooding and all those things uh, if you see bangalore uh, our the highest point is uh, what is that um, bangalore golf club which is in high ground that's why it is called as uh, sorry bgc bangalore golf course that is is called the high grounds chal near chalukya hotel that's the highest point in bangalore and it radiates in all the directions towards hebbar towards mysore road towards bannergatta road that is highest point we have got lots of ridges and valleys is it not and bangalore is also blessed with lots of lakes but people are blaming lakes uh, is overflowing and uh, residential layouts roads everything is flooding okay imagine we have got so many reservoirs sir mr vishwashraya construct so many reservoirs like uh, kras and all assume there is no dam in kras what would have happened so many every year there would have been floods in all the downstream of uh, nanjan god so other places mysore everything would have been flooded if there is no keras now there are series of dams on the throat india which is functioning as a storage and also they are used as flood control we, in the basic civil engineering we also read we state that all the reservoirs are used for flood control also is one of the concept now it is a keras may be a big reservoir okay like that but we have lakes are we using lakes for flood control is the question why we are not giving a serious thought to using lakes as a flood control what is the simple thing which we have to do simple thing is keep the lake level down during winter okay what does big engineering is required for that is that big engineering required so simple small opening in a waste weir maybe 1 meter or 1 meter up 2 meter by 1 meter or something allow the waste water to flow during rainy season keep the level down keep the level down just by opening the waste weir 
So lake will almost be say one one meter half meter down. Whenever the rain water comes, that the flood water will get stored in the lake, and then afterwards it will be slowly flowing in the whatever the opening we do in the waste weir. So it is, it is as simple as that one. I don't know why government is not doing. Uh, maybe if some people are seeing my presentation here, if it goes to their ears, uh, I can have some help to do that. It is very simple. When a, when a KRS can do something on the flood control, why not we do lakes as a flood control? Why do you need, need the lake to harvest overflow? Keep the level down in the winter, keep the level up in the summer. That's a simple engineering. We don't require anything. I saw a newspaper article yesterday. Some 650 crores has been sanctioned to put a sluice gates to the lakes. It's not required. It's not just to make a small opening, use some 10 labors, make opening of one or two meters in the waste weir, keep the level down. Whenever there's no, there is no rain, correct. There is no rain now. So that lake level water can go in the storm water drain to the storm water drain capacity. We are talking on this increasing the storm water drain capacity. That's not the engineering. Engineering is to keep the level down in the lake during winter, allow the flood waters to enter to the lake. And then afterwards, close it in the summer. So the water level will always arise because all the lakes are getting sewage or treated water or partially treated water. Again, it will fill. Another thing advantage is all our lakes are polluted and uh, it's also becoming green in color because of eutrophication. When you open the lake to a certain extent, all old water will go and then new fresh water will come and join. You will be improving the quality of water also of the lake. It is in thousands of rupees or lakhs of rupees, not crores of rupees. It is very simple to uh, do almost 50 to 80 percent of uh, uh, flood control in Bangalore can be done with simple uh, uh, civil management, which is in lakhs, not in crores. So uh, with this, if there are some government people are listening to me, I can always help in at least reducing, if not 100 percent, I am 100 percent sure that we can at least 50 to 80 percent of the flooding problems in Bangalore. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Just a small token of our appreciation for speaking here today. Thank you. Uh, with that, we uh, close our introductory sessions and with, with the keynote session, and we start our session on visions for wastewater reuse in Bangalore and beyond. Uh, to kick the session off, I would like to ask Dr. Anand Kodavasal, who is the proprietor of Ecotech, as well as an NGT-appointed expert. Um, he has 30 years of experience in the area of decentralized water treatment, and his interests are in water resource management and wastewater management. He's also been an advisor to the KSPCB, a senior advisor to the KSPCB, I stand corrected, um, and um, has, and just to let you know, Ecotech is a consulting company specializing in wastewater treatment, which was established in 1986 and is recognized as one of the foremost companies with wastewater treatment in the city. Now the company provides the entire range of consultancy, engineering, and execution of decentralized wastewater treatment. Over to you, Dr. Kanarwar. Thank you, Shreya, for that uh, introduction and good morning to you all. Uh, I was just wondering on what topics to speak uh, today, but uh, Dr. Morgan Roth uh, gave me a good uh, start. He asked a few questions. So in fact, I have answered uh, many of these questions in many of my uh, uh, LinkedIn articles. For instance, the first thing he asked was, what, what is the technology should be used? Yeah, certainly the most optimum, most practicable, most suitable, most appropriate technology, not just go by uh, uh, labels and uh, uh, tags. You don't have to go for the most modern technology or the most uh, high tech technology. In fact, we have seen again and again, people get carried away by these tags. We have seen most modern technologies fail in India because people are not uh, ready to run these, operate and maintain these uh, technologies. We have ourselves uh, uh, converted high-tech MBR technologies put up by some of the most uh, competent uh, builders, they are, they are unable to run that plant. So we have converted into, into a simple, conventional, classical extenderation system. And in fact, we have done more than 70 such conversions or surgeries, I call it, of SBR technology, MBBR technology, uh, anaerobic technologies, MBR technologies, EDOX technologies, you, you name them. 
we have converted them and we have seen most of these plants are dysfunctional because of use of wrong technology at the wrong uh, place. So you use what is most appropriate. And we have found over our, the years, number of years of our experience, for the size of the STPs we are talking about in the decentralized urban STP space, meaning from about 100 KLD to 5,000 KLD, the most appropriate, most suitable technology, sustainable over a long period of time, over the entire life cycle of a treatment plant is the extenderation system. Uh, in fact, I can share with you uh, one of the oldest plants which we operate is for the Unilever Research Center in uh, Whitefield, which originally started off as the Brookborn Coffee Factory, instant coffee factory. We are still run running it. It is based on the extenderation. And the cost of ownership of this technology, of this STP, is the least over 30, 35, 40 years of its life. So that is the kind of uh, technology that is robust. It is robust, it is reliable, and it is easily uh, managed. You don't need high levels of skill to manage like what, what is called for in a membrane technology. So that is the number for first question. The second question that, uh, Dr. Morgan Roth asked was whether there is value in wastewater. Yes, certainly. Uh, during our studies, we find that the break-even point for a uh, STP to pay back or break even is 80 KLD now. An 80 KLD STP, the operation cost will match the, uh, the value you get out of that. We find in uh, residential complexes, we can use 55 to 60% of the STP output for various uses, which the KSPCB uh, mandates for uh, toilet flush, for gardens, for car wash, for, for common areas wash. 55 to 60% is recyclable provided the STP works. And when you see 55 to 60% is about 50 KLD. 50 KLD is straight away 5,000 rupees per day. 5,000 rupees per day is what is the operating cost for a 80 KLD or 100 KLD STP. By operating cost, I take into account everything. The energy cost, the manpower cost, the preventive maintenance uh, consumables, chemicals, uh, uh, spares, the routine preventive maintenance cost, and there are certain annual maintenance items. So if you factor in all these and work out the per day cost, 80 KLD is typically about 5,000 to 5,500, and therefore it's a break even. And that's one of the reasons I would I would think the government should uh, ensure that it's only 80 or 100 KLD and above which uh, should be mandated to have an STP. It doesn't make sense to have an STP mandated for a 25, 30 KLD because people are not going to run it. The operating costs are so exorbitant, people are not going to run it. They'll just put it up for mandatory requirements. And then you will have a whole hundreds of cesspools across Bangalore, just because the government has mandated, they will put it up, but they will not run it because of the high operating cost. Just imagine 25 KLD is uh, generated by a 40 apartment complex. For a 40 apartment complex, if the running cost of an STP is 5,000 rupees, it is a huge amount of 1,000 rupees. 1,000 rupees uh, per, per month is the maintenance cost each flat owner has to pay this is a totally unsustainable cost. So that is another reason. The other thing, other question uh, uh, Dr. Morgan asked is whether these real-time monitoring is useful. That is another favorite subject of mine. I, I have written uh, about this. I have said it's putting the cart before the horse. And I'm, uh, it's not just 2,500 uh, Shreya, it's more than 3,500 uh, decentralized STPs in Bangalore alone. And I think uh, Vikram from the back will be able to uh, confirm this. We, uh, there are more than 3,500 and more than 500 MLD, million liters per day of sewage, are supposed to be under treatment in these decentralized STPs. Unfortunately, and uh, this is one of my favorite uh, subjects, 85 to 90 percent of the uh, treatment plants are dysfunctional, and that's why you see the reason why the lakes are polluted. I'm not so sure it is the industrial waste which is causing all these pollution of the lakes. It is the untreated, semi-treated, partially treated sewage from all these residential complexes, which are the major cause for pollution of the lakes. In fact, even the foaming of the lakes. Foaming of the lakes, again, I don't believe it is because of industrial wastewater. There is a concerted uh, number of reasons why foaming occurs in these uh, water bodies and other lakes. Number one, the concretization of Bangalore. And therefore, there's no ability for soil to uh, absorb the water. So there's a huge amount of runoff. The intensity of rainfall has increased tremendously. Therefore, a huge water, uh, uh, runoff from the rainwater because of concretization. 
untreated, semi-treated sewage coming in, encroachment of the uh, water bodies and uh, water courses, which has narrowed down the pathways for the water to flow, which in turn increases the turbulence. I, I'm a great fan of turbulence. Turbulence is one of my subjects which I studied uh, in during my PhD years. The increased turbulence because of all these factors uh, operating in concert is what causes the foaming. I'm not sure it is the industrial waste, but it's the, uh, because uh, uh, domestic sewage, there's a lot of phosphates which are coming, which, which can cause. So a number of factors acting in tandem causes the foaming. So th these are some of the questions. And I believe the answer, the solution to all these problems lies in educating people about the usefulness of having a good STP, operating STP, make the best use of it. When I started my career about 35 years ago in this uh, as Ecotech, I was trying to highlight the uh, environmental benefits for the uh, people so that they will uh, listen to uh, what I'm trying to say. But environmental consciousness is the last thing on anybody's mind, either in Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, uh, Pune, Mumbai, anywhere you go, they're not bothered about the environment. The main thing is how much money I have to spend on the treatment plant. So later, I switched, the, uh, switched my uh, spiel to saying you can get huge economic benefits. As I said, if 80 KLD is the break-even point, if you have a 300, 400 KLD STP, it's a gold mine. The STP is going to mint money every day, giving you back a DD, a demand draft, for about 20,000, 30,000 rupees. Just an example. Phoenix Mall here in Mamadevpura, it's a 500 KLD plant. We recycle and reuse nearly 400 KLD, 400 to 450 because of the huge HVAC requirement. That's straight away 50,000 rupees per day saving for the uh, Phoenix Mall. You can imagine, it's a gold mine, 50,000 rupees per day. Then the other benefits, of course. Uh, now, more than the economic benefits, now I'm stressing the need for water security. In future, even if you are willing to pay 500 rupees per kiloliter of water, it may not be available. STP is the only guaranteed perennial source of water for all these secondary uses. So make the best use of the STP. If you have an STP, maybe it is dysfunctional. There's always a way of making it work, putting in the money, make it work. And we do this uh, calculation, this computation in every report we give. What is the return on investment? Even if you have to spend 50, 60, 70 lakhs, what is the return on investment? What is the payback period? It's hardly a few months. So this is what we have to educate the people. And I would like uh, BAF also to get involved in this. Th this is the huge benefit when you have large apartment complexes, with 500, 1000 KLD STPs, dysfunctional. It really uh, makes me cry. It's a huge loss. So multiple benefits. One, water security, economic benefits, conserve fresh water, protect the environment, and you are free from any harassment from any of these uh, PCB uh, fines or uh, compensation demands or NGTs uh, fines and compensation demands. Multiple benefits of a good STP. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. An STP should be an asset. It should not be a liability as uh, Ravi Shankar said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kodavasil. Just a small token of our appreciation. And with that, we'd like to kick off our panel. I think uh, our last two speakers did a great job of setting context um, in how it uh, applies to the most immediate issues that the city is facing, which is flooding. Um, and um, I would like to uh, introduce the today's moderators and then the panelists. Um, so we have the session moderated by our, uh, uh, our collaborators at AWAC, uh, Dr. Johan, um, uh, is a postdoctoral researcher at the Environmental Social Sciences Department at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, which is AOAG, um, and is affiliated uh, uh, and is an affiliated researcher at Circle at Lund University. He is an economic geographer with a specialist focus on regional industry dynamics and sustainability transitions in infrastructure sectors. His work has been published across the social and economic sciences with notable publications on theoretical and empirical issues related to the spatial dimension of industry dynamics. We also have Dr. Christian, who's a group leader in the cluster sustainable transitions and business innovations um, at the Department of Environmental Social Sciences at AWAC. 
He's also an associate postdoctoral researcher at uh, Circle Lund University in Sweden and a guest lecturer at the University of Zurich. His main research interests are centered on the potential for transformative innovation in the water and energy sectors by combining recent insights from transition studies, economic geography, and institutional sociology. He aims to explore how multi-scalar institutional arrangements hinder or support radical innovation in clean tech industries and sustainability transitions in key infrastructure sectors. I welcome you to <laughs> the discussion. Uh, I will introduce our uh, panelists one by one, and I just request you to come and have a seat. Starting with uh, uh, Vikas Brahmavar, who is the director of Transwater. Vikas started Transwater System in uh, 2011, and prior to that, he was running a proprietorship entity called uh, Blorby, which was also um, um, into trading of water treatment products. Prior, prior to moving to India in 2008, Vikas was working in London as a software engineer and investment in, for an investment banking firm. Over the years, Vikas ha and his team has served uh, more than 10,000, I'm sorry, more than 1,000 clients, and he holds a design patent and has applied for another patent on a unique method of designing wastewater treatment systems. Our next speaker is Shavan Donti, who's the managing director of Green Lantern and the CEO of Tankavala. Commercial pilot by training, he founded Sky Taxi, a chartered flight company in Mozambique. He came back to India because he was moved by the water crisis in Africa and wanted to make sure Bangalore doesn't follow in the same footsteps. His father, who you heard from earlier today, is an ex-BWSSB advisor and has a background in water management. And they started Green Lantern together. He set up Tankerwala with his wife, Molia in 2020, which is a tanker aggregate, uh, aggregator startup through which he is also trying to boost water reuse and ease tanker, tanker transportation. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ganesh Shankar, who's the founder and CEO of FluxGen. Ganesh is a serial entrepreneur in sustainability and climate tech with a career vision towards making sustainability the default choice for all. He's currently the founder and CEO of FluxGen Technologies, with the goal of de-risking industries from water crisis. He has also co-founded the Sustainability Mafia, um, a section eight for impact organization with a mission to multiply the impact for sustainability leaders through goal-oriented collaboration. Next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Vikram Rai, who's uh, our collaborator and also the general secretary of PAF. Vikram has been in Bangalore for over 25 years with his interests lying at the intersection of communities, cultures, and collaboration. He's an engineering graduate from Bitspilani and runs a health tech startup. Vikram has previously co-founded co a social impact consulting firm before which he worked in the technology industry for eight years. He's also the trust trustee at the uh, Mithu Foundation and a co-founder of the Flourishing Bangalore, uh, Bangalore Collaborative, which is an emergent co collective working to developing, develop a flourishing city. Vikram has played multiple roles in the growth of the Bangalore Apartment Federation as a general secretary in his uh, uh, previous term. His envisions, uh, he envisions BAF to build on the strengths of its network and provide member associations and residents a clear platform to adopt best practices in sustainable lifestyles. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Aditya Rao, who's the founder of Green Greentivity. Uh, Mr. Rao is the, uh, has spent 26 years in the industry, uh, in the IT industry in sales and marketing roles. In 2018 and 19, this apartment dweller who's also a member of BAF and uh, um, founded Green Tip in uh, the Bellandur area, uh, in the Bellandur area, founded Green Tivity in response to the need and gap identified in the market for a reliable, professional, and responsible water treatment company. Today, Green Tivity is recognized as a trusted company among the customers they serve and their STPs are showcased uh, as uh, uh, STPs that work well in Bangalore. Uh, I'm gonna now hand it over to our moderators. Thanks a lot for the very nice introduction, uh, Shreya, and welcome also from my side. It's a uh, real a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to discuss, you know, what we are really passionate about with all of you that have great ideas on how to actually you know, create new solutions in this on-site water use space. 
So thanks a lot for that. And actually, I think um, Dr. Kodavasal has really set the scene for this first panel really nicely. So what we would like to do here is not discussing how we can sort of solve incrementally the current problem with this functional STPs, but rather create some bold vision. So what could we do in the next step? How can we create actually or turn water use into an aspirational solution that actually, you know, RWAs, dwellers, um, the builders would want to install not because they have to because it's mandated by the government but because they see it's like a good thing to do and it creates tangible benefits that are also mentioned like you know return on investment uh new income streams for rwas and so on and so we basically thought it would be nice to bring in a few really um, innovative um inspirational thinkers and then discuss about what their bold visions for the future would be what are sort of new solutions new business models that could really scale um, also beyond, you know, Bangalore itself and really create this new aspirational um, solutions. So over the past years, we have been discussing with um, our friends at Atri, but also with many of you already, uh, what could be inroads, you know, in actually changing the, this on-site water use game and taking it to a next level. And as Bernhard has mentioned, there's these two generic routes. So one would be to improve the on-site sort of water use system. So actually create water qualities that are at a really high level. So RWAs can reuse as much water as possible inside um, their fences and by that avoid paying uh, sort of huge prices for tanker water and so on. And of course, you know, there are a few also panel members that have worked in this direction and that go almost to potable water quality levels. And so there's a key question about whether and how we should push this route in, into the future. And then there's a second uh, solution, um, which is complementary in many ways, which is really selling the excess treated uh, wastewater to outside users in the construction industry, for landscaping, uh, for other sort of private industries, and actually creating a new income stream for RWAs through that sort of, um, uh, let's say, off-site water use uh, market idea. And th also there we have some really interesting entrepreneurs on the panel. Um, so there's, of course, key questions there. How would you match then uh, the supply and the demand? Um, you know, how can you guarantee certain water qualities for certain end users? How do you organize logistics, pricing, and, and so on? So we can discuss that in a minute. And I think, you know, really think we want to first discuss these bold visions, what would be possible in the future, in the best of all worlds. Um, then we talk about, you know, what, how could we sort of scale what's current sort of niche solutions to become more mainstream in the future. And then also talk about the key challenges on the way, you know, what would we have to do collectively to really sort of reach these um, lofty goals we have in mind. So that's basically the framing of this session. So I like, would like to uh, kick this off um, with a question or talk about the first sort of route, um, you know, first, like creating high quality on-site water use. Yes, please sit down. <laughs> 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 so it's maybe a question to Vikas Bramavar. So you have worked with creating high quality um, on-site water use systems. So what's your sort of bold vision? You know, how far could we go with this uh, high quality on-site reuse idea? Yeah, thank you. Or you can use my mic. Um, this morning when we all came here, right? We stood at various traffic signals. My vision is in one day in our country, above the signal board, there should be a big banner saying, this is the dam water quantity. This is the treated reusable industrial water quality. There has to be two big boards, we should say. And that's the way you create awareness where what is available to us and what is not available. So uh, if we consider two cities in the world, Cape Town, and Australia, 2009, 2000 onwards, 2000, 2009, both of these cities had water problem. One city realized and created the scare of no water, no water scare. The other city started putting billboards like this saying what is available to us what is not available to us. So the awareness has to be from inside. You can't push things to people. Uh, in terms of reusing water quality, I would say um, in Bangalore, we don't even have the data exact numbers of how much water is going out as waste. 
we have a data saying that around 200 crore liters of partially treated water from the apartment complexes go to the drain on daily basis. This is equivalent to 13 Varathur lakes in a month, right? That's a significantly large volume of water, which is people spend money on it, treat it, and then send it to the drain. Whereas the, there is a case where industry keep exploiting borewell water, keep using municipal water. What if we are able to tap this entire market? When we had a discussion with KSVCB and horticulture department, they said 70 crore liters of water is required for garden. Out of this 200 remaining, all water is still available for industrial water demand. So if you're able to get it to a quality where industries buy and make it profitable, then it will work. So this is uh, my vision. I will probably 10 years later, we'll see all billboards knowing exactly what we have. Thank you. May I ask about the idea of reaching potable reuse levels? You know, is that something to pursue and to push in the future? Definitely. So we met around 100 apartment complexes, said that we will give you potable quality water from your excess STP water. All the, all the 100 of them straight away rejected psychologically, we cannot accept. I can go to Singapore and drink it, but in India, I cannot drink it. So I, I was adamant in terms of convincing people. We spent one and a half years, but it didn't move there. It is not just at our country. It's everywhere in the world. There is psychological barrier. Until it comes to the neck, people wouldn't adopt to take it for drinking. So we thought, what if we convert it to very high quality water and make it useful for industry? So we decided to approach laundry industry where we convert STP treated water to a very high quality water, where laundry unit for a washing machine, if they're using 400 grams of soap, if they use our water, they'll use 125 grams of soap. So it's direct cost saving for them. And also they don't exploit boreal water and it's almost at the same cost of water they are buying. So this made the entire economics viable. Industries became profitable. It's a profit for us. Apartments have this problem of wastewater, where do I dispose? I use 20%, where do I dispose the remaining? So they have this problem. So the entire cycle got solved. And there is a huge demand for it where people don't know. Now the industry stops running for three days if they don't have our water. They want our water only because this is very high quality water which we give. So I think converting it to portable reuse, first stage would be for industrial supply. Eventually when it comes to neck, people will start taking it for their own consumption. So thanks a lot. Um, I, I have a follow-up question for Aditya based on, on uh, the continuation on the top, this topic. So, so because you work, you're an STP vendor working uh, almost by definition with very conscious customers, right? Customers only come to you if they're very conscious about getting their STP to work. Um, from your experience working with these types of clients, uh, what do you think it would take for them to go all the way to portable reuse? Or if not all the way to portable reuse within their own facility, what would it take for them to take the option of selling the excess water uh, uh, seriously? So for those of, of, you know, for most of our sites, the water is, uh, the STP treated water is, uh, you know, almost at a level of drinking water quality Vis you know, visibly at least, like, you know, some of you all have visited our plants, you being one of them, or Vikas has come and a couple of others have come to our plants. Uh, now, the challenges of reusing that treated water within those apartment complexes, again, it's a mindset issue, you know, whether what uh, Dr. Anand said or what Vikas is saying. But then most of my customers are open to collaborating with people like uh, Vikas and, you know, we've uh, facilitated some of those conversations where, you know, they are okay with uh, either selling or giving away their STP treated water, right? But then for this to go mainstream, right, we work only with very, very, uh, you know, conscious customers who are very particular about what they need you know, or where they want to be with regards to their STPs or their wastewater treated quality, right? Uh, so now those customers are just a handful and they are willing to collaborate because everyone has this excess water. You know, you can push an apartment complex probably to 70, 75% reuse in-house. But then when you have a 300, 400, 500 KLD 
kind of a plant. There's always that 100 or 120, if not more, in KLDs that is uh, in excess. And then what do you do with that water? You want to be conscious. So there are, ha there have been these con conversations, you know, tri party with the apartment association, ourselves, and someone like Vikas, wherein we are looking at models to collaborate. Because as a pure play STP vendor, I may not have the solutions or we may not have evolved uh, to the extent where we can address both the bubbles. And I, do, I personally feel that this can be replicated across every apartment complex or across every customer who has an STP. You know, uh, Sir was saying where there's a will, there is a way. That will needs to be created. So it can be done. Thanks a lot. So we will come back also to key challenges maybe that we have to overcome in moving or creating this awareness and sort of spreading this idea beyond the, the five or 10 percent that really care about quality today. So we can come back to that. But I first wanted to now also quickly discuss the second vision, which is creating these offsite markets where you can actually sell the excess treated water and sort of create additional income streams. And Shravant, you have been very active in, in this field. So in your most daring dreams, you know, where do we stand in five or 10 years with this sort of new idea? Thank you. We've been debating about uh, changing the mindset of people, right? Just now, so I was just mentioning that uh, it takes a behavioral change, uh, a psycholo psychological awareness to, to really implement this to drinking water level. Who is doing it? If you look at it, which countries are doing it? We're talking about Singapore, Israel, and really, really countries that has no water at all. Of their own they're doing it and they're doing it well and it's sustainable for that change to happen here first of all i don't think it's even immediately possible because of all the challenges of the psychological uh, constraints that we have so when we also began with the similar idea right so like everybody is having stps they're using water to shower and and to drink and cook whatnot but at the end of it, we tried convincing the same way that you guys have done it as well to, to explore the use of water beyond just uh, toilet flushing and irrigation. And uh, we realized that instead of making a very difficult change, why not look at something else completely outside of the equation, right? So we started to see the construction sites and where the highest amount of water is consumed. The construction industry by itself is one of the highest consumers of water, where absolutely nobody is touching it or like, you know, really in contact with it on a continuous basis, like that you would do even in a toilet flush for that matter. That's more uh, closer impact that you would have. So we started to explore the options of construction sites. Now at the construction sites also, they were, you know, they were still uh, worried about, is this good? for construction or not. A bunch of uh, research has been done about it and uh, it has proven multiple times that this water is more than fit than the standards that's issued by the IS uh, 456 code of the construction. So it is actually clinically uh, or laboratorily we have checked it and it's possible that it can be used for construction. But the point here is where there is an STP, there's no construction. And when the construction is there, there is no STP, right? So we started to solve that problem by including the hyperlocal thinking of it. And you know how we have Swiggies and Zomatos and the Dunzos doing very hyperlocal jobs of getting things for you within 10 minutes and stuff like that. That means somebody close by selling you something that you need. And when the construction companies are buying water, on tankers or extracting groundwater left, right, center, we started to talk to them about using STP treated water that could be transported to them. And then if they were ready to use it, some of them, again, again, because of the psychological barriers and not enough research in the industry, they started to say no. But today we can proudly say that most of Metro construction activities that's going on in the city, we supply water to it on a daily basis about I would say about five, 600,000 liters a day on a daily basis goes to all of these construction sites. And we're talking about Metro with a dynamic load running on that 
train continuously on these uh, the, the the platforms and the rail tracks and stuff like that. So when it can be done there with that kind of load, and you know it has been going on for a while, and uh, now we are augmenting it with more technology and a lot more you know uh, research that we have done in this, and we have started to solve this problem. So coming back to the previous question that we were at, the the problem of your extra treated water at every STP can actually be solved if we use it at a different place instead of the same place, because it takes a lot of energy and, and a lot of psychological changes that you've got to do to convince the people. And here you don't have to convince anybody. You just have to create the logistics network. So for that matter, Vikas and I are already working together on creating the network because logistics is one of the most important things to solve this as a problem. The water shortage that we are looking at in the city can actually be uh, literally made to zero. There won't be a water shortage. We were just discussing about how much water is available. There is so much water available. Just that if we start to change the way that we look at it, if we start to use STP treated water for construction and the water that they're using for construction for drinking, our water shortage is solved effectively. So the numbers are like a few, maybe over 100 uh, million liters plus or minus, but uh, it's almost on par. So this is what we have found that has started to work and we have found traction. People are already starting to implement it and we're hoping that it can become slightly bigger. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot for these insights. Um, I want to again follow up with with another question that kind of feeds into this, um, um, not entirely, but we will come back to that. Um, to Ganesh, um, so so you uh, you have developed a system for uh, water metering, right? An IoT-based system, and and you sell these again, just as uh, Aritya, you work with conscious consumers, right? That are interested in in saving water. Um, how do you see the potential among these clients of yours uh, when it comes to also kind of take a step towards the increasing the reuse of water, maybe also for portable purposes or maybe for selling it to, to, uh, uh, to other sites? Uh, honestly, I'm the least knowledgeable in the panel, probably in the room. <laughs> so, uh, but I come here to learn from all of them here. Uh, I primarily work on industrial uh, use case and my, no my knowledge is mostly on how our customers look at water. So it's a very interesting thing. Once I asked the CEO of a big uh, textile manufacturing company, uh, you must be, uh, you know, this textile industry so well, you'll be the most, I mean, successful here. So Ganesh, he said, I'm not in the field of textile anymore. I'm in the field of water. He said like, because if I manage water today, I'll be in the business of textile. So that's how uh, water is today. And drip by drip, it's becoming the most important aspect of ESG because it's a finite shared resource, right? So if they manage water, they are competitive in the market, right? So in that context, uh, 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 I, I would say that uh, today, if there is any source of water that they can use, which is not fresh water, that adds up to their Firstly, in the bottom line, they're spending less on it and they're building processes to make sure that they can use this treated water in their processes. So that way, if industry becomes a huge consumer of this treated water, then uh, you know there is some way that uh, water doesn't reach the contaminate the uh, drinking source. So that is one aspect of it. And the cost of uh, portable water is anyway expensive and it's only going to become more and more. So uh, my understanding is that uh, there, th this other aspect is it has to be incentivized for using this, not just only buying. The fact is that today, if I'm getting stuck in traffic jam because of drought or flood, drought because you're having a lot of tankers going to supply water. If there's a flood, obviously, you know, today we all experience. And there's also cholera and other outbreak because of water. So water has a very connected thing to the whole ecosystem. But when you're talking about uh, solutioning or services in water, it is siloed, right? If my healthcare system in the city is going to get affected because of water, if my transportation is going to get affected in times of water and my electricity network can get affected telecommunication, why are we not incentivizing solving the problem of water with other uh, connected ecosystem, whether it is me getting a lesser electricity charge or discount in my electricity bill, if I'm actually using a treated water, because 
it is solving on a problem which is connected so all the problems of water are connected but when you are saving water or making use of best methods of water there is no incentive that's i think is a bit that i would like to communicate with atri and team so you can bring it so that uh, there is more incentive to use uh, treated water and doing good whether it's rain water harvesting all the other good things about water these are the two points i want to mention thanks a lot so now we've mostly covered this sort of supply side like the industry side and i want to also ask um vikram about more the you know resident welfare associations perspective on this so hearing the visions we have discussed so far so what would you say you know what would stick you know with the the ones that actually you know run these systems have to pay for them and you know what could be visions that really resonate we, we've heard that there's a lot of benefits in a way that could be reaped from having well sort of working integrative on-site systems but you know what's what's the side of the the, the the dwellers you know what do they think about this i realize that i'm the one person on the panel who's sitting on the rwa side slightly lopsided but uh, um I count Aditya as somebody who's been part of an RWA and then has swapped over that side. So uh, I think that uh, market should be, uh, I mean, good enough to having made that jump. So anyway, I think from an RWA's perspective, a couple of things that I wanted to reflect upon uh, is that uh, today more than uh, any time before, I think there's a better opportunity to uh, uh, look at the value of uh, uh, treated water than ever before. In fact, uh, we as Bangalore Apartments Federation, we are, uh, we've been in existence for a few years, but more actively since about six years now. Incidentally, our, our origin and, and identity is connected to the word STP because uh, it started with a policy narrative where, I mean, the government came back with a rule which talks about uh, all apartments of a certain size having to fit uh, uh, a sewage treatment plant uh, retrospectively. Of course, we opposed it at that point of time because we believed that, you know, that's a, uh, that's not a very populist uh, approach to take. That was a knee-jerk reaction, basically. But we have come a long way from there. Uh, we have about 1,100 uh, resident welfare associations under our uh, uh, platform today, uh, between whom they have about 200,000 uh, households who are... Uh, who are who who stay there in those apartment complexes. My conservative estimate is that between our own, and Vikas shared some data points, within our own uh, member apartments, we might have a captive capacity of close to about 150,000 to 200,000 uh, uh, KL uh, kiloliters of treated water additionally available. This is assuming uh, um, a very optimistic utilization of 50% of treated water already, uh, which may be high, but let me go with that number 50 to 60% if it is used, remaining 40% which is available uh, uh, additional, that must be about 150,000 to 200,000 uh, uh, KLD, right? In fact, one small pilot with a tree that we are attempting uh, in one area in and around here is about, if I'm not mistaken, about 6 lakh 60 uh, KLD right kiloliters per day for the parks project so 200000 kld is what we have as capacity of various levels of quality right i don't want to comment on that there's a lot of background to um, dr anand spoke about quality of stps how well uh, the treated water is being produced etc but suffices to say that there is tremendous amount of supply which is already available right now what is the challenge i think um, the entire wastewater value chain is still not very uh, uh, um, aggregated, right? Uh, there are two uh, levels of challenges uh, for a market like resident welfare associations to deal with, and I'm sure all uh, my uh, 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 friends over here will agree. One is, I think the re resident welfare uh, association market is a very challenging market segment itself, right? It is comprised of people who there are 10, 15, 20 people who are decision makers, uh, none of whom have the responsibility and accountability to, to take that decision in a time-bound manner. They are all doing a volunteer voluntary role. Uh, I mean, how well motivated they are, et cetera, is a big question mark. It takes a long time for making purchase decisions. I'm sure all of you guys experience months of negotiation with them. By the time it's ready to make a decision, the committee has changed. 
somebody new comes over there you have to start all over again etc so it's a very tough market and in that market if you have a very consultative solutioning process that will be very inefficient we need a very cookie cutter kind of an approach basically right you need to be able to make sure that you know what what you're going and offering to them is very well bound and they're able to buy that and we need to have very comparable um value metrics right with which they are able to say that you know if i make this choice this is what the benefit that i am able to get a comparable example which we did which we have experienced is in the solar space we had some degree of success in adoption of rooftop solar within our members we have i think a good 150 200 of our members who have installed rooftop solar uh, systems over the last 3 uh, 4 years largely as the technology has emerged i think there are some learnings from there one of the things which worked greatly in favor for us is that we made a very uh, a sharp economic value proposition there right most of the resident welfare associations park their funds in what is called in fixed deposits right bank fixed deposit which yields probably a low single digit uh, percentage interest rate of interest they very safely park there our argument with resident welfare associations was that if you install rooftop solar your irr on that is 16% at the minimum bank <laughs> you don't need any other arguments right so the sales cycle reduced a lot uh, including in my own apartment where the decision was made in two months it's been three years since we have now installed a rooftop solar system working really well so we need to be able to build a very cookie cutter solution to this for which the value chain has to be well integrated today i think one of the biggest challenges for treated water is like shavant mentioned where does it go to is there a demand uh, over and above the distance that it has to cover i am very glad to hear that i think that ecosystem is coming around i think even uh, partners like atri are playing a strong role in bringing that together there are lots of you guys who are contributing to ensuring that the technology is also well uh, uh, evolved and stable but yes i think supply is definitely there uh, uh, we need to able to make sure that the the business model is crisp cookie cutter and then it is well integrated backward integrated to the demand where for example construction is a great example of uh, uh, where the utility and demand is there so if you are able to map that yeah we have a winner and economics play a sense dr uh, um, anand mentioned about roughly about 60 rupees being the uh, per kl uh, treatment cost per day if if i 5000 rupees is what you mentioned for about 80 kld so we are talking about 60 rupees 70 rupees per kiloliter per day it can i mean that's i am guessing for a well managed uh, uh, stp system we have systems where costs go up to almost 90 rupees 100 rupees per day today i mean coming back to the point which ganesh mentioned today the value of water is still not very well understood right first of all the value of good clean drinking water itself is not well appreciated uh, there so much of wastage which happens so much of consumption wastage which happens we buy clean water at about 19 to 20 liter kil per kiloliter whereas the cost of treatment is about close to about 70 80 90 rupees so the economics is still not close by for people to be able to uh, um, uh, understand that so i think a lot of work on that has to happen as well the supply is there if the value chain is well structured very quickly we'll be able to supply uh, i think it will make a lot of sense please Thanks a lot for these insights. I want to follow up quickly also with the others on the panel about this point that also um, Dr. Kodavasal has raised that there's actually the return on investment already exists for the Resident Welfare Association. So it's not like a dream out there, but it's already pretty feasible. Do you share this positive view or is there actually st- some more work needed to really, you know, define at which size, which levels you really reach return on investment in a, in a short period of time? I would like to uh, bring to the table um a case study that we were just we have just uh, you know um executed at our other company uh, at green lantern we do sewage treatment plants and uh, for a construction company uh, they, they basically it's an apartment project that's in construction right now and they have a demand for about 4 million liters a day now look at it it's 4 million liters a day in one project that is needed and it's practically impossible for them to figure out either tankers or groundwater to explore that much and this is in chennai so everybody knows the situation of groundwater there so and the city is completely dependent on tanker water which comes from outside of the city so this uh, project what i'm talking about is we set up a sewage treatment plant at a 
a government nala so which is basically the sewage drain or it's supposed to be a stormwater drain which is polluted and it's uh, taking a lot of sewage right now so we did a pilot project with them for a 100 kld plant uh, which is in a prefabricated metal structure and we were just doing the math yesterday with uh, Veena. the the cost of treatment is rupees 20 for a kiloliter and they were currently they are still currently purchasing more water on tankers for about 120 rupees per kiloliter and this is both sewage treated water right sewage treated water and they're using it for construction now if you do the math at 120 rupees minus the 20 rupees that you would use for or like you know for the treatment itself so it's 100 rupees savings per kiloliter within the year within 365 days you have recovered the entire sum of that project including maintenance breakdown maintenance everything put together so economically it's totally viable dr anand sir uh, was mentioning that you know the 80 kld 100 kld these numbers are accurate this this is the right capacity that it can be implemented because the economics starts to play there and if you're talking about markets where the city is dependent on tanker water for construction forget any city that you take is using water for construction and it it need not be groundwater everybody can create a model like this across the city and that can become a source by itself see right now being in the tanker industry we know for us a source means borewell water source that's just generally how it is you will see these pipes coming sticking out and then a tanker standing under it pulling the water from the ground straight into that and right now we're working with stps on the same way you can see this pipe sticking out of the stp and then you know our tanker goes and picks it up from there the econo the people the way that they're cha like you know thinking is completely changing and economics is viable already you just have to figure out where to put up this stps and where the construction sites are so this can easily be solved there is i mean we have we, we've gone past that hope stage we are in the stage that it's reality and like you know it's everyday work for us again i come back to the point that uh, you know a i agree with you sir that uh, it is doable it makes economic sense and somewhere if you know the both of you dr anant and you and i agree that that 80 kl is the break even you know below that it doesn't make uh, sense maybe uh, people who have those 80 kl or lesser uh, sized uh, stps need to look at some other ways of how to treat it but then it is doable and uh, in a larger scale uh, plant uh, probably you know between 30 to uh, 200 uh, mld uh, the cost of treatment comes down drastically to about nine and a half rupees right uh, we are responsible for one such plant which is treating uh, you know the sewage and that water is going as portable water to you know the kolar district so anything is possible but you know the customer and depends on who you look at as a customer right uh, is the customer willing to go that extra mile or is the does the customer have that vision to do it or is the customer only going to be penny wise and pound foolish and this is a word that i use with much disdain right uh, and when you look at the primary market at least uh, you know for vikas or dr anant or myself uh, it is you know uh, let me say apartments uh, because satish is also here right now everyone in an apartment probably thinks that it you know it is someone else's problem or it is the government's problem and here you have these same people who have learned how to you know uh, manage lifts manage firefighting equipment you know manage solar installations and all that jazz but then how does the lack of ownership come when uh, it comes to sewage it is something that you are generating you know th these are the same people who are doing composting and managing wet waste right being an apartment dweller who's transformed myself into an stp vendor today i'm really disappointed with my own community so where there is a will there is a way a lot can be done right
so uh, one of the things that we i want to emphasize on my previous point is um, uh, from the problem of connected system right so if it said that if climate change is shark water is its teeth so now where is the climate financing going today if you know the um, real catastrophe in the system is happening in the climate adaptation side i think there should be a incentive model where some of this climate finance should actually move into incentivize some of this wastewater treatment plants and such that when there is an incentive where that some corpus amount is actually coming from the climate finance there is a larger intent while there is will is a very important thing now there is an incentive so the will will multiply right so uh, that mechanism has to be worked out this i feel the fintech part of water science is not figured out yet if that is actually uh, right in the place some of it will not be just the return on investment from the money that is coming from the uh, consumers or producers it is coming from an external capital which is today one of the largest capital even the us government has pledged right and various i mean india has also pledged so it is very important that we start tapping into that capital into this market and we have seen wonders happening in solar how the price of solar panel came down over the years of time i mean when i was in solar almost 12 years back cost of panel was 120 rupees per uh, watt peak today is almost 22 rupees so how do you bring that economics down so there has to be i mean government started with subsidy and various other uh, financing to actually make this happen same sh should be applicable for waste water management as well that's the missing piece in my opinion if i might directly follow up on that another um, issue which we discuss a lot is whether you know the business models you mentioned uh, whether actually now we have a lot of uh, one of a kind design solutions so basically it's a civil engineering logic so every apartment complex gets its own sort of tailored solution but could we also standardize you know the basically the solutions we provide so that there's also sort of a package turnkey solution that can be installed in different departments with only minor adaptations so you also reap economies of scale and all that size so it becomes more of a mass produced sort of product business so is that a vision you know that you how far could we go in that direction also for scaling then beyond bangalore itself you know into india and potentially internationally i think that should take it Uh, yeah so um christian that's what we are exactly trying to do in terms of uh, scaling so what we have noticed is with stp uh, it has been too many technologies involved and each one saying their technology is best each one needs to be specific for the apartment so there are too many variation there are 212 companies in south india who's working on stps okay so um and finally to the rws what import, what matters is the consistent quality of water monday morning they should not have smell in their flushes okay irrespective of technology finally it boils down to the operators who maintain the system and give a consistent quality of water so what we realize this there is always going to be variation in the output of the stp there will be little variation there is always going to be variation now how do we handle this variation right what we set up a system which is dpr direct portable reuse and categorize water just on two factors is it portable is it non portable now if we categorize in these two the source doesn't matter if as long as it's portable we are able to standardize on a system post stp and it can be like a small container so now we have made small container which is 50 kl which can fit in two car parks little big one of the largest small 8.2 lakh square feet uh, it's two and a half car park space where they have given we say we take two and a half car park make your whole mall sustainable right so that commoditization can is possible post stp is what we felt based on what we saw uh, and it's easily uh, doable to either 2500 apartment three so all they have to do is give away three car parks or two car parks and it can be a commodity which can be set up the important challenge we had is to treat this water and finding buyers nearby but product wise it can definitely be commodity uh, there can it can be a commodity see uh, i agree with you on the post stp treatment part right but the 95% of the stps are non functional 95% of the stps are non functional so if i were to be myself and say you know all of us probably are trying to build a castle in the air on the cloud 
right? When the base itself and there's potential there, and I don't know how, you know, whether it is us STP or water vendors or the RWA or A3, how we're going to come together and create this awareness or this ecosystem or this sense of responsibility among the citizens who own these STPs. That was When it comes to sense of ownership, that is what is that's missing, right? Like generally, like an STP is, though it is our own waste, we don't want to manage it. If it's solar, if it's anything else, we are able to manage it. As the way that I would look at this problem is, I, I mean, it's very, I've realized that changing human beings with their behavior and the psychological is the longest and the farthest way to achieve goal so incentivizing things like he was just talking about earlier is sort of the way to to um, solve this problem now i can ask anybody here that's running a business would you um, you know would you make would you not care about your business you would right so you you would take every single step every single effort to make sure that your card is working your lights are working in the office everything is fine so that you can do your job right the way that um, we want to look at this problem is maybe not right now a reality, but in the future that what we want to try to achieve here is if a company can look at anybody's STP as a resource, right? See, solar, most of the solar things are done on a boot system, right? So people look at it as an investment. Why, who, I mean, some random investor is putting money into their apartments on the top and they generate money out of them because they have extra capital. So why can't we look at sewage treatment also like that? See, everybody's trying to solve something, right? The, the reason that we are sitting here is we're talking about decentralized STPs in apartments that are not working. Every time we hear the statistics, 95% of the STPs are not working. There must be a reason. I mean, yeah, technology is there when, it, like, you know, when there is a will, there's a way, there's absolutely no will about it. That's it. So they don't have the will, but somebody else should find the will in it, right? So if I have the will to solve that STP, regardless of who it is, which apartment it is, and then it becomes my own to, to generate the right resource of it. And then people like you are ready to invest, you're investing into your, uh, you know, um, into people's other people's STP so that you can make a resource out of it, right? So an economical backing is what is missing. Nobody is conscious. Like, let's just go beyond that. Let's just really go beyond that. We are not conscious people who would care about the environment until, or I would say never. We'll, we'll see the end of it because we have seen the track record. I mean, let's not keep much hope about us changing. The only way we can see change is probably economically making viable that's what we've been doing profiting from the environment from the day that we started to come out of the caves and then you know agriculture and whatnot so when you said the right word commoditizing water was never ethical right now it is right commoditizing water is the way that we have to see to make sustainable developments to keep more than 95 percent of the plants running and not 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 so that's that's where I would like to bring the point. Uh, which is, I come back to that point I mentioned earlier about, I mean, integrating that value chain, where every uh, stakeholder plays a role. It's not possible for everybody to boil the ocean, right? See, from an RWA member's point of view, this is uh, a kind of a practical statement, right? I need to install an STP which costs money. Uh, it costs a lot of money to run and maintain it. There are occasions, many occasions when if it is not maintained well, it will stink, right? There's a lot of water, treated water, which is produced, which I don't know what to do with, right? And then there is a regulator who's sitting on top of me who, I mean, we are not even talking about the elephant in the room, who will penalize me if something goes wrong. So the primary responsibility sits with me. I think this is the um, general sort of uh, psychological statement from an RWA member's point of view. Not to say that that's, that's right to endorse, right? But each of these problems need to be solved for well enough. 
the smell problem like uh, uh, all of my friends have agreed over here can be solved right it's a technology problem it's a maintenance problem if you're having enough robust solutions to make sure that it is being run 24 bar 7 the way it has to be run it won't it won't produce itself the cost and economics problem also i think the example solar that you gave is because the, the demand went up, obviously the cost came down. We can make that happen basically, right? Similarly, the whole excess availability, you guys are solving for that problem. If you are able to do a demand supply matching between where treated water is present and where it is required, it requires a marketplace basically, right? It, it just, we need to map who needs it and who has it basically. We need to also work on, very importantly, the regulators and policy uh, uh, makers supporting this approach. Right. I think today, sadly, that doesn't exist as well, very absolutely, right? From a policymaker's point of view, I don't think so. They understand the uh, uh, the value chain approach to treated water as what we want them to appreciate. They look at it as a uh, as a compliance issue. Of course, it is compliance because wastewater has an environmental implication, basically, right? It has a very strong environmental implications, very visibly seen by optical optics like pollution of lakes, etc., which is true. I think a lot of uh, our apartment complexes are contributing to that lake. So they need to be aware of that. But the approach to that policy making is not knee jerk by saying that, you know what, there's penalties for you, et cetera, and all that. They need to be able to curate the, the overall value chain. Also, in partnership with everybody else, it has started happening a little bit, but it needs to happen a lot more. So I think all of us also need to also work with the, uh, the, the government and the policy system to give the due, I think what Ganesh is saying is right. I mean, are, are we even interlinking the impact of water to various uh, aspects of our day-to-day -day life, right? Uh, health is like one outer <laughs> dream that you have, but it is important, obviously, right? I mean, today what water we consume uh, has impact on, uh, on our health, basically. So I think there has to be a policy uh, maker, the government who needs to recognize this and it is our responsibility also to make make it uh, uh, make them recognize that and sort of be the curator of this uh, the ecosystem as well right they need to bring together market players technologists uh, consumers suppliers everybody together and say you know what makes this much more integrated where is the incentive uh, right i absolutely endorse your point saying that you know if you're treating water today you should be incentivized not penalized right so there should be a degree of incentive for that so um, I think uh, uh, dealing and negotiating with regulators and uh, policy makers is also an important part of uh, our uh, shared but uh, collective responsibility. Basically. Um, so I have a, a general follow up question to all of you. Uh, so we've heard a lot about incentives now and how to create incentives, right? And, and we, I think we can agree that it all boils down to financial incentives in this case, right? Um, and, and uh, we've heard about one model that I think both uh, Green Lantern, Tankawala and, and, and um, uh, Transwater are working with, where you basically take over the financial responsibility for the supply side, so to say, because you have the demand to match it with. But can we see uh, any other potential models or is this the way to go, so to say? And this is not only directed to you, it's also for everyone to give input. I would like to uh, bring the point what Ganesh was talking about earlier. You know, there is climate funds, right? So these climate funds are sort of places where the, the money has to reach a place where there's, it's going to create an environmental impact. That's a very small portion of the money that's there in the entire, like, you know, the world, the economics. There are more funds than just climate funds. Why not a normal VC fund, right? Why not any investor? See, the business model that we were talking about earlier uh, with regard to um, you know, uh, setting up an STP and recovering the cost within the year from a plant like that is if you are able to put it, I mean, if you are able to project that as a business model and where people can invest into it, right? It need not even be massive investments. Like, you know, the, we're trying to come up with a model where it is um, something like a mutual fund, right? So the company or the, the pool of people are going to own multiple assets, not just one STP. So you're going to have share about 10, 20 STPs that's, that's running and that's generating revenue for you. And a group of people are going to jointly own all of that. 
and somebody wants to invest into that, it can become a model. So what we are trying to achieve is it's it's a long shot and a much further way to reach from a climate fund or a VC fund to convince them that this can work. All it takes is a bunch, maybe four or five people to come and come together and create a small fund for, for just this and make it economically viable. And there is enough places in the country that this model can be replicated and made be viable because of the, the, the acute shortage of water that's there. This is one of the way forward for, you know, the economic way of incentivizing people, right? So incentivizing people is not just about setting up STPs when it is necessary, like in, at, a, at a compliance level. Why not set up STPs when it is not even necessary? Do it at places where it's not even mandated, like put it on a nala and a like a government land. You take the water from the government and treat it and sell it. The government will be more than happy to to sort of you know see such kind of business models pop up, and everybody makes something good of this. Like you know the investor has payback, and people are getting cheaper water. The ecological uh, environment there is also conserved. So there is more than one business model. His is one hours of just logistics of the existing thing is one and a boot model or a build, operate, own and transfer model is also another one where you can uh, create a sustainable way of uh, this industry. I had one point, Kaveri phase five, government is spending 5,500 crores on this infrastructure, right? Now this is for a water which is coming from 100 kilometers away and at a very subsidized cost, government is supplying, they are never going to make profit out of this. Now the same 5,500 crores, if they put 2,500 crores onto decentralized infrastructure, the entire problem of Bangalore is solved. Now the problem is government always wants very big projects. They want big projects. They don't want small, small things because they cannot say it outside. Right? So they want big projects. So this attitude uh, has to change at the center level. Second important thing where all the economics will work is, see, um, we have always been thinking what is the level of the water in the KRS dam. Okay, all our Bangalore's water is planned based on, this is the level of water in the dam, we will distribute this water based on the level. We always kept on praying for the rain gods to give water. We never thought of what is going out of the city. So if we are able to map what is going out of the city as an important parameter, every economics will start working. VCs, all the investors will always look for 10x returns, uh, which is not proven for investors to come in at full speed. We, can, we cannot raise a 100 million fund immediately coming to this because there is no track record that it can give 5x return, 4x, 10x return. So there is no track record. So uh, this is what is my input. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So I see Shreya walking around with a sign saying zero minutes left. So uh, I guess it's time to wrap this discussion up. I think we could continue for another hour or two. It would be very interesting. But I just want to thank you for, for your insights. It was really interesting and inspiring. There's a lot of ideas to follow up over lunch with, with, with all of you. So really, thanks a lot from our side. And we will surely follow up, especially about these coordination challenges and how they could maybe be tackled you know, in this broader ecosystem that's being created by A3 and everybody else. So yeah, thanks a lot. And yes, I give over to Shreya. Um, I also just wanted to say that we have the member secretary, uh, 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 Mr. Srinivasalu from the Karnataka State Pollution Control Board who's joining us virtually. Uh, I think you heard half of the panel discussion, sir. So uh, we would, uh, I, I just wanted to introduce Mr. Srinivasalu first. So um, he's an I IFS officer from the 1997 batch and is currently serving as the member secretary of the Karnataka State Pollution Control Board. He started his Indian Forest Service in Nagarholi National Park and then went on to work in uh, Bangalore Rural, Mysore, Kala Burgi, Kola, uh, Kopala and Chitra Durga districts. Um, he's brought in new measures which have benefited lives of tigers during his tenure and now he's uh, uh, very impressively trying to bring in change in, in terms of wastewater reuse in the city um, in, in the Pollution Control Board. Uh, sir, if you could just say a few words um, with regards to what you've heard in today's discussion, um, we would really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, uh, it might be better if you said.
gitu. Uh, so can you hear us? Okay, uh, perhaps we can take a few questions from the audience while um, uh, Mr. Srinivaslu comes online. Christian, I'll hand it back to you. Yes, so any questions? Yes, please. Actually, it's not a question, uh, just to argument uh, whatever the panel, panelists uh, discussed today. Uh, because of the climate change, today we have an excess of water towards Bangalore or Bangalore surroundings and all. This may not be true in the days to come. Maybe another five years, it may become ultra, it may become Europe, may become something. This may become something based on the uh, uh, pollution which our humanity is causing. Uh, the groundwater in and around Bangalore, actually, there is a government order not to extract groundwater for uh, construction and all, but uh, nobody is following. Uh, in the earlier days, I remember, we never used to put the seat belt in the when you used to car and use the car. I, I never used to put it, maybe 10 years back. Now with the severe penalties, immediately first when I paid the first penalty, 1000 bucks or something, immediately we started using the seat belts. Now, most maybe you can say 90, 95% of the people using cars in Bangalore, they're using seat belts now, otherwise they're liable for penalty. So Singapore is known as the city of fines. We, they all, every mistake, they fine, they fine, they fine. So it is how we have to bring the discipline if we don't have a uh, will to do. It is one of the methods uh, uh, people who in abroad, they follow, they put fines. So this may be one solution to bring a sustainable solution. Now, second thing is uh, we talk of STPs. Uh, we talk of 95% of STPs non-functioning and all. Now, why, why the re root cause? I was the chairman of the committee uh, formed by the Karnataka State Pollution Control Board. Uh, to find problems and solutions of STPs in apartments about a decade back. I studied more than 200 apartments. In the 200 apartments, I met uh, the operation maintenance people, I met the builders, I met the resident welfare associates. Each, each had their own problems. So what is that problem? When I asked the resident welfare association, they said, my power cost is very high, I'm not getting labor. And then builder used to say, I can't afford this. The cost of land is very high. If you take so much of space in my building, uh, where I should get? I, I, if instead of that, I can have four, four car parts or 10 car parts, I can make some money. Then the operator say, uh, the, uh, the operators used to say, sir, so much of smell. Uh, if I get another job, immediately I'll go. So, so the operators, the operators will just say, they'll find some other way, some other this one. Then well, uh, residents, uh, welfare residents said, so much of power charges, sir, that, upper, that our, the other apartment is paying less power, I'm paying more power. What is the reason? Then our uh, associate, resident welfare people, I met the members, they used to say none of the members is ready to take the uh, operation maintenance issues of the STP because they don't want to go into the STP itself because it's a issue, social issue. I, they don't want to see sewage at all. So they, they, still, though I was telling you in my presentation, uh, it is an industry. Uh, it's very raw materials free, reliable, end product as demand, byproduct as demand, it addresses climate change, all these things. There are good successful case studies, there are good, uh, I mean, even failure studies. You learn from good success case studies and copy that. In failures, you analyze, there is a will, there is a way. Now, government has made it mandatory uh, to reuse the water uh, in apartments, and many sincere apartment associations, they are doing that, and they still they have excess water. But government has said, make it zero discharge. Where, where they can put that zero discharge. So they can use maximum 30, 40% of water. Le rest of 70% after good treatment is left into the dry. You know, 60 to 70 rupees per kale of water we treat it and put it into drain is as good as putting money into drain. Is as good as putting money into drain. We are not finding a sustainable solution for that. So in the panel discussion, I heard uh, uh, so many good things that uh, there is there is shortage of water someplace, there is excess of water someplace, and this water, if it is go to some other place where it is of beneficial use, it is always better. So it is, uh, economically it makes sense, but only thing is we have to make a, make a government should always plan uh, how, 
how these things useful resources going waste into the environment uh, which is cost money it's always possible to find a solution it's not that it's not possible to find a solution there where education now another thing important thing i was to say i did the uh, doctorate degree in at the age of 50 at the age of 50 i did phd uh, there is only one engineering college in bangalore uh, in karnataka which produces environmental engineers only one that is jc mysore where it has got a postgraduate degree in environmental engineering now, I, after that there are postgraduate degree there are some uh, 30 people come out of that college of which 50 are girls they get married and go to usa europe and all none of them goes to the this one another 50 people they go to software industry and all and none there is no single environmental engineering coming out of the uh, government even today it's very difficult to find environmental engineers. so government should plan something to find a uh, specialized people to do specialized job so this is also one of the things which is missing in the our planning thank you thanks a lot a lot of questions <laughs> maybe there's two key ones one is about whether fines could be a solution and then how to create a workforce that's sort of better educated you know especially for the o and m part that's something we didn't really discuss so uh there's not a question over there shall we maybe collect that too and then you know we can sort of respond in a sort of ah, okay Yeah, the question I have was that we heard a wide range of uh, costs for waste, the treated wastewater. So we, you know, you said 20, which is the lowest I've heard so far. Uh, the MBR plant in Coven Park yesterday we heard was about 24. Uh, and then we heard um, uh, Dr. Anand Kodevasal talk, talking about more like 60 to 80. This is quite a wide range. Uh, so I have two questions. One is... Um, does everybody think that 20 is a realistic uh, end goal? Because at 20, I think that you can reasonably argue that it's cheaper than tanker water and probably cheaper than even borewell water uh, when we are pumping from the depths we're pumping. So if somebody, if you guys can resolve this and then just give their opinion of, about whether 20 to 25 is a realistic number. Yes. Just some very short answers to very long questions. <laughs> See, whether, whether it is an 80 kiloliter plant or an 800 KLD plant, okay, as an operator, my fixed cost is the same. I only need three people per eight hour shift, one person per eight hour shift, whether it is a 80 KLD plant or whether it is an 800 KLD plant or a one MLD plant. So that is where, you know, the cost of your treated water fluctuates. Can I quickly add to that? At 20 rupees, it becomes comparable to Kaveri water being supplied as well, right? So <laughs> you're talking about hitting that benchmark. But having said that, yeah, I'm also guessing that that 20 rupees uh, at one end of the spectrum is also dependent on size and all that kind of stuff. But uh, 20 rupees, so absolutely. Uh, you have a winner there, <laughs> right? Uh, which, which makes it Satish and team are spending 93 rupees per liter, uh, kiloliter today for 93 rupees, basically, right? Uh, and still have to worry about what do I do with the remaining water that they are ready to give it away for free, right? So, uh, so I think at, 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 uh, at closer to those numbers, it becomes really, really, which is what I talked about making it very simple for people to connect to the economics just becomes uh, relatable i had one point um, this uh, amortization plays a big role for example if someone considers an investor considers amortization over 15 years then the cost becomes really low uh, what we have uh, seen is all the funds which are coming they generally see an amortization of three to five years so for it should not be for solar, they see 15 years for this, they say three to five years, which should not be. If that amortization number changes, then this two paisa and six paisa problem can be solved. Investors, private investors, three to five years, which is really aggressive uh, because they have been at 15 years. You're saying that it will become 22 paisa, 20 three rupees. Paisa, I think, for estimate. So maybe uh, also to cover the question about the workforce development, I find that also pretty interesting. I uh, wondered whether somebody from the panel wants to respond on, on this one, whether we need uh, additional education sort of initiatives or something like that. 
Running a company in the environmental sector and not being from the sector is highly challenging, right? Because it's a, I mean, you can imagine like people like, you know, at the RWA, I'm just one of them, right? So I'm a, I also live in an apartment where I'm just a common man with no environmental degree or a background or anything. But so I can imagine how difficult it is for, you know, for RWAs to run this. And it's hard for me to run this. Just that I run a business, so I manage the company. I have technical experts who can run the, uh, like the technical sides of this. To hire, it's a huge challenge. Absolute. It's I've, I've uh, hired more than 100 people in the company, like, you know, on and off. But the hardest role is to get the technical support. So if nobody is training and if there is not much incentive, like, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to, like I told my dad, like, you know, I want to be an environmental engineer like you. And then he said, please don't. <laughs> and then look at, look at us today here, you know, right across the table. And, uh, and I left aviation to be in this industry, right? So, so what happens is if there is enough incentive for the people to, to choose the environmental sector, I, I literally am the ambassador for environmental people who have to study environmental, though I haven't done it, but I am the ambassador for it because only if you have the right technical expert will you create the right solutions. So uh, uh, we just are desperate to find the right kind of training. And for training to happen, people should find jobs. And for that jobs, there should be good economic viability. So it always boils down back to money because that's where our civilization is you know, uh, concentrated on. Like you create money, through environmental thing, people will hire you, good pays, people will choose, more colleges will open. So I think the solution for this is again, economic route. Thanks a lot. For economy and ecology have the same root echo, which, is, which means home. <laughs> okay. Yes. Training and skill itself. Yes, I think it's a critical part. I think a lot of part about today, maintaining and running a good system also is about that layer in between, whether uh, providers like Vikas are able to augment that capacity to run the systems. In many places, there are in-house operators who are running it, who are woefully short of skills, basically, right? So we need to be able to augment that category of STP operators. And there's a very important category of estate managers in, in resident welfare associations. So we are now beginning to uh, pin our hopes, not on the resident welfare association members, because probably they couldn't care less and they're very busy. We are trying to do. Uh, 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 we are trying to institutionalize training programs for estate managers in partnership with collaborators. One of the things that we are beginning to institutionalize something in is on the in the area of fire safety, for example, very important but often ignored, etc. But targeted towards estate managers. Those are the ones who are there six days a week uh, and know the systems well, etc. So we need to be smart about where we are also integrating. Um, training, skilling, etc. So in some sense, yeah, that's also part of that. But I thought I'd leave that uh, thought. Thanks a lot. Okay, there's one question online. Um, shall I read it or does the person want to speak up? Yes, Abhishek, please. Hey, um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for this excellent panel discussion. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not able to join you in person. Um, so maybe for some of those uh, who have not met in the last visit, so my name is Abhishek. I'm a postdoc and a project manager at AIVAC. And I'm part of this, this uh, uh, water reuse project that we're trying to conceptualize, leading uh, co-leading the, the governance aspects and the word package on that. My question is uh, quite simple. When we did an uh, anal analysis of the decentralized treatment plants uh, uh, through the forest project a few years ago, one of the key reasons why we found why plants were failing to function in the way that uh, we would like them to is a lack of monitoring. And now in this panel discussion also, it became quite clear that you were talking about uh, many uh, uh, possibilities of reuse opportunities, both commercially for different types of reuses, right? But something that I, I, I was hoping to uh, hear from you is also a little bit of the quality assurance, because when you compare it to solar, it's already standardized. It's 220 volts, right? The, the technology is already clear, but uh, um, in water, there's a whole spectrum of possibilities of, of uh, uh, water quality that would come out of the treatment plants. So what are your thoughts on standardizing some of these fit for purpose uh, use possibilities? And also for some of you like uh, uh, Shravant and, and, and Aditya, 
who you are already providing this these you know uh, um, micro end to end reuse opportunity connections what are you doing about quality assurance and and standards already thanks a lot thanks. um abhishek a good very good question you know quality has always been that uh, that uh, that wall um a lot of people stop at and uh, you're you're always concerned about the quality and ganesh and i are sort of like you know in lines of, about working on the the quality measurement on on a realistic uh, real time basis as well see uh, when you look at construction water quality where where you know most of our daily transactions uh, happen see there's a is code for that is 456000 which is the construction water uh, the water in construction what standards it should be maintained they haven't told particularly what source it should be it can be borewell water it can be river water it can be sewage treated water as long as the water quality when you're using it is conforming to this standards that they've specified now to do that test it's a basic lab test so if a lab can test it and they look for basically sulfates and chlorides which are you know the the components which could affect the the integrity of the structure like the steel that could, that's used that could get rusted because of this sulfates and chlorides uh, if the source of the water at a particular stp for example you know you're getting borewell water or you're getting tanker water and that apartment is a, in the same place forever so the source of that incoming water to that apartment is more or less the same so the treated water from that apartment will also have more or less the same amount of sulfates and chlorides when you when you test it after the treatment plant uh, uh, after the treatment process i mean so if you are able to do this test periodically you can conform to the standards that you know the the construction industry is particularly looking for when you use this water only in concrete mixing so this is the water that i'm talking about when you have to mix it with the cement and the jelly and and the sand and the water that water needs to conform to this but then there are so many more uh, avenues where this water can be used the way it is uh, straight out of the treatment plant uh, like most of our stps that we have done uh, an analysis of have been conforming to the basic standards issued by the pollution control board basic standards i'm talking about and this water is used in construction activity where it does not come in contact with the concrete or the integrity of the strength of the building or whatever it is i'm talking about just softening the earth like you can soften the earth and you can make a hole through it so just to bring perspective to this about every meter of uh, metro underground line that needs to get excavated about 70000 liters is needed every meter and in across india about 2000 plus kilometers is planned for the total metro and over 200 kilometers of this water is required i mean kilometers of underground tunneling is required so imagine the amount of water that can be used in this kind of situation and this i'm i'm not i'm not waiting for the the technology to reach the place where you know like you can pull out your phone and then check your stp treated water standards that is going to be go that's going to be happening but right not not right now but still there is enough market there's i every day i wake up in the morning i'm actually trying to solve where am i going to get this water you you all are talking about what am i going to do with this extra water and i'm solving i'm like on the other end where am i going to source this kind of water so the quality that we want to use is sort of right there so i mean i will ask ganesh to answer more on the the quality aspects to to bring us to speed actually our second session is going to be focused on the quality aspects and what it takes to actually make that happen so i'm going to allow christian to wrap up the session today and just wanted to say thank you everyone for attending yes thank you very much for a very inspiring discussion and let's continue over lunch and later on today it's a very inspiring and interesting so thanks to all of you for your inputs and for your questions
ఇంట్లో ఏం మాట్లాడుతున్నా జోరుగా మాట్లాడచ్చు జోరుగా వస్తుంది రామచంద్రము
Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I just urge everyone to come in and take a seat so that we start the second session. Hello, everyone. Um, I just urge everyone to take a seat. We're going to start the second session. Uh, to kick the second session off, we have the Honorable Syed Khaja, sir, uh, who's a senior environmental officer at the Pollution Control Board. Uh, uh, sir, I invite you to say a few words. You know about the work we've been trying to do. So I invite you to say a few words about wastewater reuse. So. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are enjoying uh, Bangalore's climate. And luckily, you are in this part of the city. You don't need boats. <laughs> OK, coming to uh, the reuse, uh, let me start with the toughest part of reuse. Uh, I'm not getting into toilet flush and gardening and all that. That's all standard set. We are all already using it. The toughest part is using the treated water, treated sewage for the construction. So construction means there is a lot of quality issues. There has a uh, uh, compressive strength, and then uh, there's a tensile strength. What is the impact of that? Um, now what chemical reactions happen when there is impurities in the water? So all these things play a major role for which Standards are very important. That's what I've been asked to talk about. See, uh, you are all aware in India, we have uh, uh, IS 456, um, which talks about the standards of water that need to be there for the construction purpose. This is updated again and again. Latest one is uh, in 2000, it's updated. So 456-2000, it's available in the uh, website as well. This talks about only the parameters like sulfates, fluorides, and uh, salt content, hardness of the water for different purposes. Like if the building is towards the seashore or in the sea or outside, but there is no mention anything about the treated water because the concept of using the treated sewage, sewage treatment was not there during 70s, 80s, and early 90s. So now the time has come where we need to have a separate standards for that. And um, surprisingly, we're also working with ATRI. Uh, we had a meeting uh, along with the uh, Indian Institute of Science. We did some research. Nowhere in the world, the standard studies are there. Standards have not been drawn for the usage of treated sewage for construction. So we initiated it in Bangalore along with IASE. Prima facie, they have completed the study and uh, they have also come out with some minor suggestions um, saying that, you know, this water is safe to be used for the construction purposes. Now we are approaching uh, BIS, already communication is started. Uh, BIS is a Bureau of Indian Standards. Earlier, we used to call it as uh, ISI. Now it is uh, a B, uh, Bureau of BIS. So BIS, it might take, there is a lot of uh, detailing which goes into uh, before they finalize that these are the standards. And very soon, and um, I'm hoping by uh, next uh, June 5th, the World Environment Day, we should be having the BIS standards wherein 
the BOD, COD, these values will also be included in the treated sewage for the construction purpose. If this happens, uh, it will be pride that uh, initiation from Bangalore and Atri, um, uh, the first in the world to have standards for the construction of treated sewage. And to tell you again, because some of the builders are over here, it is very safe to use the treated sewage for the construction purpose. I'm not going too deeper into the molecular structure, what happens and all that. But see, compression strength and tensile strength, these two are important. Cement, as it comes in contact with water, it becomes hardened. It's, in, it's not a rocket science. We did the testings. There was no difference at all, not even 5% difference when you use the treated sewage. So what we did, just for the testing purpose, we even use the raw sewage. Because if somewhere the testing is done, the treatment is not done properly, it should not have a negative impact. We used even the raw sewage. Even there also, we did not find any difference in, in the uh, compressive strength. So now the question comes the tensile strength. So what is tensile strength is important. You are all aware we use a steel. Steel doesn't take any load, but the wind and all that, when it swings the building, these rods are the one which brings it back. You may not feel it in smaller buildings. Uh, if somebody had gone to Petronas Towers, uh, there they have got a system where you can also literally see See, up to 8 to 10 centimeters, it swings when you are in the building. You can feel, you may not feel the swing, but you can see the swing. So, still nothing happens. The building is brought back. This is because of the steel, which takes the tensile strength. Now, what will be the effect of this water, which might contain some little more sulfates? Because, you know, we use uh, soaps and detergents and other uh, things. And uh, there is some sodium, what we use in our daily consumption of salts and uh, urination. All these things will increase the sodium content and sulfur content in the water. If this is not treated properly, will it have any effect on the corrosion of steel? It should not so happen that after 50 years, the steel has become a hollow. So we did the testing for over a period of time because uh, uh, um, compressive strength is very simple. You test on 14th day or 28th day, but still you need to allow it to get rusted. This study was done in IISC. Surprisingly, it's very simple. Uh, we, we did this study for the record purpose. The moment steel, this uh, concrete gets hardened, it goes to the temperature as high as 85 degrees inside. So at that temperature, water will totally get evaporated in less than 48 hours. So there is no water moisture available in the concrete after 48 hours. That is the reason externally we try to uh, you know, give what, what you call as a curing. So it is very safe that uh, it cannot have any impact um, on the steel for the corrosion. Because for the corrosion to start, the contact period minimum required is you know, 14 days. So on the second day itself, the temperature is so high. Secondly, the pH, um, alkali uh, and acid. Acid corrodes steel, you are all aware of it. Alkali doesn't corrode steel. And the cement, it attains the pH of 13.5. So it's very safe. The salts content or sulfates content, what is available, what if at all if it is available in the treated sewage, will not affect the corrosion, uh, corrosion of steel. Hence, the tensile strength is not affected. However, BIS will come out with the standards. And second thing I was to talk, I was asked to talk about is uh, um, about you know monitoring, how important it is. So very much. Um, monitoring is very important. Unless you have that data, you cannot plan any future, especially uh, in the decision making and in a legislature or policy making, data is very important. So uh, we have Ganesh here, I don't know where he's sitting. Uh, yeah, you are there. Mm. And uh, sensors are all uh, have come up now. Uh, sensors when it uh, came initially about three years back, people were talking about 12 lakhs, 14 lakhs. 
it has come to 6 lakhs now it's coming down to 2 3 lakhs it is uh, same like uh, uh, during uh, i saw the first time calculator when i was in 8th standard uh, somebody from Dubai with a bright light, they brought uh, the calculator. I, I remember at that time it costed 125 rupees. Now for 10 rupees, you get a calculator. So electronics, as you're all aware, as the time goes by, the prices drop down drastically. Same way a day would come, may not be too far, maybe in about one or two years. Uh, these sensors, we should be able to get at less than a lakh. So, which would uh, help in having the proper uh, monitoring mechanism. We don't need to physically go and uh, check. So, any interactive uh, questions, please feel free. Yeah, okay. See, there are... Uh, on two occasions, normally you don't get questions. One, if you understood fully. Two, if you have not understood anything. <laughs> I hope the second thing is not there. Anyway, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, please. <laughs> You have to wait for a BIS to do something. Yes. Why can't we have some pilots? Yeah. Because that will give some data points. Yeah. Right. Good question. So what we'll do is. We have decided to start this immediately, but for the curing purposes. We would like to wait for BIS to officially give a nod, wherein for the load bearing structures, the RMC, ready mix concrete, and uh, for mixing of concrete, and uh, uh, it can be used because BWSSB is using for the water retaining structure. They have used it. But however, let's not take uh, any risk with it comes to that. Because if some building collapses, the contractor would say PCB trolled some dirty water, it collapsed. So let it not happen. But for the curing purposes, uh, you might be knowing better than me, 60% of the consumption of water in the construction is for the curing. So curing can be started immediately. Yeah, please. Um, so I'm Priyanka. I'm yeah, yeah. a fellow at Etri. Yeah. yeah. So a question. Uh, so when we are talking about creating these standards, we are always thinking from a point of view of uh, making concrete uh, of like you know of good quality. But we are not thinking about from the human health perspective in the sense that there will be construction workers who will be uh, in direct contact with water, and if you go on the site, you will see children also roaming around. So we should. Like this is just my comment that we should also include uh, standards which are of concern to human health and not just uh, salt and other content. Yeah, uh, Priyanka, thanks for this question. So I right away spoke about peripheral, you know, on surface. If it was only tensile strength and compressive strength, BIS would not take more than a month to do. I said they will take close to seven eight months. The reason is this. So, uh, when IIC took almost at, uh, 12, one, one year to do the studies, they have considered, they have given us all the data into that. I will share the reports with you. Okay. So, these points are considered. Not just this, they have gone a little deeper into inhaling mm -hmm. and uh, uh, once people get inside after a period of time and uh, it's a newly constructed house, you have gone inside, everything is dry. Maybe, you know, you pour some water on the wall. Will it have any effect of things coming out? All these things are being studied. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, good point, uh, Priyanka, about the human health part, because, you know, the standards need to cover all different aspects. So one suggestion I had over and above BIS, uh, there are other organizations that have direct linkage with the building industry as such. So, for example, at IAPMO, we developed the uniform plumbing code. Hmm. Now, uh, so that uh, goes into the national building code. So, BIS, of course, is one body uh, and, you know, its standard is recognized and all that stuff, but it comes under the uh, Ministry of Consumer Affairs. Uh, I think that the opportunity we are talking about is in the context of construction industry. So, you know, there are credis of the world, the, the, the state chapters of credi, 
and there is this entire national building code uh, we can come together with national building code and try to incorporate this in the code itself and code is a sacrosanct thing code cannot be changed okay so if the code uh, adopts this thing about saying that uh, sewage wastewater treated wastewater can be used for construction purposes including all these aspects of human safety etc then it becomes part of the code and then building industry will have to necessarily follow it bi standard is usually except in very very exceptional circumstances like the bottled water uh, we get is a mandatory standard but most of the bi standards are voluntary standards but if we think and we are confident that this is how uh, it is going to help the building industry and save our national water resources we should aim to get it into the building code itself that would be a, a recommendation from my side no thanks for your suggestion uh, very frankly let's be very open we never thought of this we were thinking only about bis and um, like you right, rightly pointed out bis is only a suggestion whereas it has to when we make it mandatory there has to be you know uh, something beyond that uh, nbc is a good idea anyway we are working with atri make a note of it and uh, let us uh, approach uh, um, nbc also and uh, it's a good suggestion thank you Hmm. 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 So uh, once the BIA announces this code, it can sit there. I yeah. think it's a matter of addition. Yeah. But luckily, the green standard is sitting in NBC now. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Um, I I want people to ask you more questions, sir. But I'm going to request that that happens over lunch. uh we have a panel discussion uh now which will go on till about 120 followed by the closing remarks and then any other questions that we have uh let's use this opportunity to actually uh, since we're in person to talk to one another over lunch so yeah. uh i'm uh thank you very much sir we wanted to give you a small token of our appreciation every time i come uh, how it, how useful it is but definitely useful for me i go back with a gift <laughs> thank you uh i'd now like to um ask our moderators for the second session uh dr eberhard who i introduced earlier this this morning um and uh dr pg ganapati uh to come to the floor I'm going to do a recap of the bios for those of you who are joining later. Dr. Eberhard um is the head of process engineering at Airwag and um he his research interests include wastewater treatment, membrane bioreactors for water reuse, control of biofilms, biofilm reactors, biological drinking water treatment, decentralized wastewater treatment and energy recovery from wastewater and organic residuals. He is an editor for the water research and water science and um and oh, sorry he's an editor for water research and for water science and technology he holds um several um uh educational degrees and the, the uh, and a phd from the technical university of munich uh dr bernard i'm um, sorry uh, doc, uh next is mr ganpati mr ganpati i request you to come uh to the floor um Mr Ganpati is an infrastructure and sustainability professional with over 25 years of experience in the space of infrastructure uh, water and sanitation housing and real estate um he was the founder and director in charge of eco first services a sustainability uh, sustainable design consultancy which offers infrastructure and design services to large buildings and townships he has also worked as an individual consultant with the world bank and adb and he also used to head a cdd and now is a senior advisor there um i would now i would like to ask our panelists to come to the floor um starting with uh, mr selva rasu uh, mr selva rasu is the md of lead consultancy and technical committee member of the uh, igbc the indian green building council uh, mr selva rasu um 
is one of the market leaders in uh, MEP for MEP uh, in India for MEP and green design. His company has been awarded le uh, the leadership award by both uh, the US Green Building Council and the Indian Green Building Council. He's one of the founding members of the World uh, Green Building Council and the Indian Green Building Council and the recipient of the Parivartan Sustainability Award for the year 2013. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Dr. Nimish Shah, who is the Managing Director of IAPMO, to come to the floor. Uh, Dr. Shah is an accomplished global health and sustain, uh, sustainability innovations business leader with over 25 years of experience in British multinational consumer goods company Unilever. Recently, he served as Managing Director of India's Toilet Board Coalition, shaping the nation's program with a low-cost operating model and bringing new corporate members to the table. As a knowledge partner for the Indian government, Dr. Shah helped set up the Global Sanitation Center for Excellence. He holds various degrees in microbiology and business management, as well as a PhD in life sciences from the University of Mumbai. Um, today, we were meant to have uh, Mr. Kaulagi Shripati. Unfortunately, he is unwell. So I would like to ask Ganesh Shankar to rejoin us uh, to uh, have some representation of the water consumption in uh, industries. Um, uh, Ganesh's company FluxGen currently does water um, quantity um, monitoring for several industries, including Nestle and Tata. Um, next, I'd like to call Dr. Inayatola who's the director of the Water Institute at UVC Bangalore and a professor in civil engineering. Dr. Inayatola has 30 years of experience in the space of water and civil engineering. He's won many awards and grants during his period. He's been the chairman and member of several academic bodies at the Bangalore University and is also a consultant of various developmental projects for the government of Karnataka. And last but not least, I'd like to ask Mr. Suhail Rahman uh, uh, to come to the floor. Um, <laughs> uh, he's the MDO, uh, MD and CEO of CoEvolve, a governing body member of Credit Bangalore. So Hale's passion in sustainable practices has led to landmark product, projects such as Asset Aura and CoEvolve Northern Star, both of which have won global recognition with mentions in the United Nations case studies as, a well -being, uh, select, uh, as well as being selected consistently among the top rated residential communities in the APAC region by the World Green, uh, World Green Building Council. He's also chosen uh, he's also been chosen as the most enterprising CEO in 2016 by World Sustainability Group for his contribution to sustainable developments. He's an angel investor with interest in construction, tech, virtual reality, augmented reality, and sustainable technology, among others. He's an engineer from um, um, and has an MS from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, and he's also completed his uh, business leadership program from IAM Bangalore. Thank you all for being here. Over to you. Um, Gun, Mr. I can start off. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. We have had very energetic discussions today morning. Um, so this, this theme for this session, and we're going to sort of, I'll set the frame a bit, uh, is key components of a robust wastewater market. And I think some of the previous panel which talked about vision for a wastewater market also covered some of the topics. So there may be a, a repeat of some of those topics, but I think we'll try and explore it uh, in a little different level of detail. Um, I, I wanted to start off by a little bit by drawing a few key takeaways from the previous sessions uh, that happened today, uh, which sort of caught my attention. One of it was uh, Mr. Eberhardt's statement. Uh, and I think these are important things uh, to keep in mind for this session and for the entire future of uh, developing this wastewater reuse market, which is this point about simple, affordable, economical, suitable to the task kind of approach that is needed uh, versus looking at the best in class and this and that and so on. So let's keep that in mind, even when we look at market issues, not just for process engineering and technology. It's, this is a very, very, very important philosophy for anything to succeed in India, in my opinion. The other point was made, which was made in the previous session is the point about 95% of STPs are non-functional. Uh, we should not build castles in the air. Uh, so there's a little realism, uh, and uh, if I may add, a bit of critical kind of pessimism needed for really things to succeed. I mean, optimism is good, but we all have to 
be a little more conscious about what's not going right, you know, and why is this happening? I think we cannot forget that. In the same vein, I think um, uh, uh, someone made a point uh, that, or more than one person made this point that India as a nation is not going to be sold by this whole idea of environmental consciousness and so on. And finally, it's economics and some basic stuff like that. You know, whether the product gets delivered properly or not, what's the economics? Those matter far more than this whole association with uh, climate, environment, and so on. Those are probably secondary issues or will appeal to a small segment, but not to a large segment. So I think we need to keep this also in mind when talking about uh, developing the wastewater market, uh, reuse market, so to say. So, um, and in, the, in one more point, which sort of didn't come up, but I want to add that to, uh, as my important sort of uh, thing to keep in mind, uh, sort of relates to up, suitable for the task or appropriateness, but looking at things from a systems kind of level, uh, when we talk of reuse, most of the time we've been talking about direct reuse, but there is something called indirect reuse, which sort of happens uh, naturally in the in nature, and uh, which can be intervened or engineered, and in, you know uh, a little bit. And one needs to, at a systems level, talk about reuse both as indirect and direct, and uh, the, ben the 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 suitability of what you know when indirect reuse is more sensible than direct reuse. And while the bulk of this conversation relates to direct reuse, so th this is just in terms of drawing from the previous sessions. Um, also, this session, we don't want to focus much, in my opinion, but you feel free, uh, Erhard, if you want to, uh, is about not addressing, uh, we are all talking about developing the market. So we don't want to talk much about uh, the reuse by the same party who's producing it, which is reuse, self-reuse, you know, which is in a building, nearly 50% gets consumed by the residents, consumer himself who's producing the wastewater. So where the producer and the user are the same, there's no concept of a market. So we can sort of the previous session has covered those points quite well. So we'll stick to where there is an exchange between someone who's producing and someone who's consuming. So the producer and the user are two different parties, like a buyer and seller. Uh, and when you talk about the markets framework, uh, just to give some structure to our conversation, uh, we can talk about demand side as a set of issues or questions. We can talk about supply side, uh, so on the demand side about behavior change, awareness, uh, 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 the whole idea of environmental consciousness, compliance to regulation, incentives, uh, so recognitions, so on and so forth, various things that triggered demand and what are the challenges or issues there in terms of development of the market. On the supply side, I would like to focus on, some of it was covered by in the previous conversations on uh, affordable solutions uh, on the treatment side, uh, is it possible to deliver to these standards? What are the challenges in delivering to the standards? Again, incentives to produce and sell. Uh, the infrastructure, because there seems to be an assumption most of the exchange will happen through tankers or, no, is that a viable model? And uh, no, what is needed? Is some infrastructure needed? And is that going to make a difference and so on? And also, and then, then we can talk about, we didn't talk much in the entire thing. A little bit, I think, was alluded on uh, competition, so to say, to this, which is essentially substitutes in this case, which is the most obvious substitute is groundwater. Uh, and so how, how does wastewater reuse compete with groundwater and what are the deeper issues there? Uh, it was The economics of it is an obvious thing, but uh, beyond economics, what are the other issues when you put treated wastewater against groundwater? Uh, then in terms of policy regulation, no, that's another component of developing the wastewater market, uh, platforms, marketplace, so on and so forth. So we could talk about all this. And I'll, I need to unfortunately leave at uh, uh, one o'clock to catch a train, one, maybe five, 10 minutes extra. So I will be asking the initial set of questions and um, Eberhard has kindly agreed to take on the session subsequently. So I will uh, uh, get going straight away because there's so much talk of construction industry, I'll, I'll start with the demand side. So I'll start with Suhail, uh, who has been introduced and runs a premium uh, organization in, in the real estate development space called Co-Evolve, right? And um, so uh, we had good news from Mr. Kaja, uh, excellent news to say IAC has done a study, the verdict is uh, wastewater can be reused there seems to be no problem. It's a matter of time before it will get into the standards and the code. That's a, that's great news. But 
um, I would I will ask you as a practitioner who builds and probably someone who's used it uh, or not used it. What are your views on reusing wastewater for the construction industry? Do you see practically? Do you see quality challenges? Practically, um, what exactly are the? Uh, you know, do you use groundwater? How do you see the whole issue of wastewater reuse in the construction industry? Uh, standards apart. Uh, and the verdict, but as a practitioner, what are the practical challenges that you foresee? Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity. So as uh, Kaja pointed out, studies such as what case PCB is doing with um, IASC will definitely help bolster the confidence of developers in using it. Uh, from a personal point of view, I have been using treated water for the past five years for my construction. So we've set up STPs for our uh, labor colonies and we treat it to sort of uh, drinking quality and use that water for construction. So as a practice, we have been doing it, but studies such as this will help in mass um, adoption of wastewater reuse in construction industry. As such, there is a rule that states that you cannot use fresh water for construction, but there is no availability of treated water for us to use either. And it's uh, sort of uh, demand is not matching the supply and we cannot wait for treated water in construction. There are processes that requires water immediately. And if you wait for a supply, it does not help our industry. So if there is mass or widespread availability of wastewater and with the studies, we definitely would be more than happy to use wastewater. The, the quality concerns are addressed by these reports. And we've, we've built a building very close by, and I would say about 50% of the water is treated water. And, and the building is standing tall without any issues. Right. Right. So uh, is there a case, you said you produce your own wastewater, but is there a case of uh, where uh, you purchased? Uh, uh, so in the absence wastewater? of wastewater, we obviously depend on tankers, freshwater tankers. We have no other option. So you have purchased? We have purchased water. And at what price have you purchased? Uh, would be something like 10 rupees per kiloliter. Treated wastewater. Not treated. Ah. Treated with no availability. Okay. I but mean, if, at the time we were if doing. If it was available, what is the price at which you would be willing to purchase it? And what's your probably source? same cost as what I purchased the tanker water? Yeah, would be the that is scenario. around hundred rupees a kiloliter. Yeah, yeah hundred rupees a kiloliter. Yeah. So up to hundred rupees a kiloliter, which is essentially groundwater when you say tanker. Yeah. So that's your benchmark for exactly. Wastewater. Yeah. Okay. And I would suggest for a mass uptake, it should be cheaper than tanker water which is where the builders would then uh, adopt it. Okay. Otherwise, economics would push them to use treated water. Uh, yeah, if economics would push them to use groundwater, you mean? Groundwater, yeah, yeah. Well, the cheapest yeah. source. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's good. I think we've got a price benchmark from a builder at 100 rupees a kiloliter of treated water can be supplied. So that brings me sort of uh, into the next question on the economics, which was again talked a little bit by the earlier panel. Uh, so, the biggest cost in groundwater, from what I understand, is transportation. The extraction cost is less than 10 rupees, somewhere between 5 and 10 rupees is my estimate, uh, for groundwater extraction. The 90 rupees out of the 100, which people tend to charge, is for bringing groundwater by you spending the fuel and the manpower required for... Uh... Now, against that, we talked about costs of wastewater treatment, uh, which range from as low as 20 rupees a kiloliter, uh, for large scale BWSSP kind of plants, maybe even going down to 15. Uh, but the practical, the 1800 KLD limit that was talked about, we are talking about 60 rupees as cost of production of 50 rupees. I think that's on the highest side, even if we were to assume 50 rupees, plus add cost of transportation again uh, to that. So how would that, do you think there is good economics for being, I mean, I know there are people like uh, Shravant doing business with this, uh, I can think of one reason why it could be economical in the sense that groundwater is depleting, so we are having to go further and further away to find groundwater, so that transportation component is increasing, whereas wastewater could be reused more closely, so the whole transportation cost can be brought down. But uh, is that the only logic, or how does the economics, uh, uh, maybe Nimish, Selvaras, if you people are familiar with this, uh, the economic side of things, would you like to comment on what's an appropriate uh, pricing and will we, will we be able to compete on price with groundwater? I think uh, uh, you know, one 
input I want to give it last one week, I've been talking to various uh, developer to whom we are working across the country. One input I'm not getting it is the real requirement of construction. How much quality is the water quantity? quantity. Okay. How much is the water required? I got various numbers for a similar typology, commercial building, ranging from two kiloliter per square meter of construction to 20 k KL. You can imagine that the basic problem here is uh, there is no incentive to monitor and control. And water is really almost available free when you compare to the energy cost. So nobody values. Unless with this numbers are known, anyway, different technology require different uh, consumption of water. Even that itself, the base itself is not ready. Besides availability, then uh, the transportation, working of the cars, it should be definitely cheaper than uh, the water, what you get from ground uh, sources then the quality also comes into the play. I think that's what I look at it, being representing various uh, committees across the globe for standardization. I feel the first and foremost thing is to understand the ground realities. Estimate different technological construction require a different kind of quantity. Then kind of mapping is required. If you ask me when I construct a building, say in um, Koramangla, where from I get a wastewater? Do the builder have this information in hand? I think the fundamental issue here in our country, most of the cities, since I work across the country, the availability of uh, the information is really lagging. Nobody knows. At least I spoke to 20 major construction companies. None of them are aware where to get, where to go for getting this treated wastewater. And nobody said we don't want. They are conscious. But whereas if you talk about energy, they know everything, they have to pay more money. I think the free meal is spoiling. The second very fundamental issue here in our country is, I just compare with the energy code. I've been traveling with them for last, uh, from 2007 a committee member of ECBC standard, a lot of development. We have a separate board, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, Ministry of Power, Ministry of non conventional Energy Sources. They are driving this very hard. And what is happening with the water? Nobody owns it. I think this is a complete shift is required in our country. We have a code for ENS, we have a net zero code for uh, building, separate code for commercial, so many things happening. In fact, I'm implementing codes for three states right now, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Gujarat. So they are very aggressive. The thing is, it's related to the cost, and common man is getting affected, and they can't live. We have power cut for one hour in a day. You can see the kind of the opposition coming from the community as a whole. But water, nobody cares. Any overhead tank is there that serves for two, three days. Nobody look at water as a scared resource. But really, the concern is after 10, 15 years, uh, one more information is now 2025, the construction industry way in which growing in India, almost close to 16% to comes from the construction sector. If that's going to get affected because of water scarcity. Just imagine the country growth. And one more study shows in India that by 2050, current scenario con continues. If you don't use treated wastewater and construction is going to stop, the 6% of the GDP is going to slow down. That means contribution is negative 6%. So I think the basic funda is bring a codes and standard, understand the ground reality, mapping it, bring a policy, and something we have to make it mandate. Oh, great. I mean, uh, I, I think there is uh, some kind of reason to be optimistic for what I, in terms of, I, based on today's discussions and the sense of things to come, it appears that um, 
there is a, we are at a good turning point on this whole usage of water in the construction industry, especially based on what Mr. Khaja said, and looking at builders who are using it. And what you are mentioning, Silverus, is that information, lack of information on availability seems to be one of the major points. So I think between all that falling in place, and ATRI is doing some good work on creating a platform which will now tell uh, what, what, where you know, the availability scenario will be very clear. Maybe that then brings us a bit to the supply side, but I'll, let me shall, you can answer the previous thing. And also I'm sure. going to pose one more question to you, which is as a standards organization, uh, suppose there was a platform that someone like A3 or X or Y would create at the enables exchange saying, it tells you where water is available. And then there is demand side buyers putting in their requests. Then there are codes that say that it is usable. There's no problem if it meets these parameters and so on. Let's say we have the codes in six to eight months time. Do you see a role for organizations like IAPMO to be playing a role in certification, medi mediating this transfer exchange, uh, besides the platform, a technically competent agency mediating this exchange? And if all that falls in place, are we going to see a boom in offtake? And if uh, the cost can be managed by making it very local, then, then there is a good uh, demand brewing is what I can think of. Sorry, over sure. to you. So on the first question, uh, you know, uh, on the face of it, when you say that, you know, uh, you made this comparison with uh, groundwater tankers uh, and and this, uh, it may appear that uh, this will become more expensive. Yeah. Uh, but I think there is one more level of uh, technical details that we could go into. And I, I think I like this whole area of life cycle analysis and life cycle cost analysis within that. Uh, because all costs have to be considered the human cost environmental cost the cost to the uh, you know and what is that cost to this ecosystem this bangalore society and i think that will throw up some useful numbers to then uh, engage stakeholders to say that you know the real cost is actually not that it is actually this and therefore this is actually cheaper and that is in the context of long term sustainability of this building industry yeah, so I think that's a thought on on the cost part. Um, on the uh, on the standards and you know uh, IAPMO um, as an organization. So uh, we are if we have a hundred year old legacy on building codes and standards, and we do it a, a, a bit on a holistic way in the sense that. Train plumbers. You cannot think about standards in isolation. You cannot think about standard only from the point of view of uh, uh, the, the end application, but you have to also think about the applicator. Uh, you have to also think about what would happen to the fate of that water, because water is, uh, is uh, in that sense, it goes through a cycle, right? When this wastewater is treated and reused, it becomes wastewater again. And what happens to that? So that entirety has to be considered when we have to develop codes and standards. So I think uh, that is something that needs to be understood widely when we are setting standards. And of course, you know, the, the next point is that once you have a standard, there is something called certification, which is about building that trust. When a builder wants uh, to use this water, Today, uh, he or she or that organization is believing one IISC report, uh, which has been produced in a certain point of time under certain context of analysis that was done. Some uh, concrete bricks were produced, they were tested and all that stuff. It's in that time, but uh, people want uh, the trust forever. You know, even 10 years from now, if this water is used, there should be nothing that is changed that affects my building and the people living in that building. So therefore certification will play a, a very, very important role uh, in getting this commodity. And your example of electric uh, or rather energy is a great example. You know, today the consumer goes and buys an energy efficient product by going and seeing those three stars, five stars or four stars and say that, you know, if I buy this, I might be paying more now, but it is going to save my energy. If we are able to reach that kind of a status in this whole water space, I think that would be a holy grail. Uh, thanks for that. I want to add to this. Hmm? Uh, what I do is uh, I'll hand over to 
Yeah, yeah. I just need Fine. Actually, uh, uh, I am I'm Dr. Nayatullah from Bangalore University. So what we have done in 2010, 2010, we organized a international conference with AMPO okay. and uh, Mati and uh, Margit and all. And idea was the plumbing. We that water, wastewater, plumbing and health. Because sometimes time the water in multi-story building that is there in plumbing. So what will be the water quality? Because that is usable. And also the head which creates in multi-story building. The water which is coming out of that how to use it can we generate power also because we are getting required head also and regarding like that we already started in 2010 and we wanted to have some transparent uh, plumbing system in bangalore university uh, to see all the uh, flow head generation and even to the wastewater which has to flow through the small turbines which can generate power all those things, but I am for later take took all this laboratory to Pune. That is the uh, in 2010. And regarding construction, uh, see that all the already permissible limits are given of what is the water. It is the quality of water, whether it is a water, whether it is a wastewater. It is the important is the quality of water. So who, who were the all the construction company, major construction company, bring all the samples to Bangalore University because we are the consultant also, the major. What they will do, they bring the samples of cement, they bring the samples of uh, aggregates, as well as they bring the samples of water. And we have to test all these things and we have to see that, whether it is a portable water, whether it is a ground water, whether it is a waste water, the components, the quality, if whether it is acidic or non-acidic, whether it is suitable for construction industry. For construction, already the guidelines are being given. If the wastewater, even HTP water, suitable for that uh, permissible limits already, which is mentioned, what is the limits is required for construction? That is, they are already using. Even groundwater, they cannot simply use the groundwater. They have to bring and test and get certified, and then only they have to use. Even for cement or whether even reinforcement, the steel, they cannot simply take the permissible limit design. They have to bring the samples and really test in the laboratory and check what is the actual permissible or permissible tensile strength. Uh, so he'll maybe knowing that with the, they have to get certified. Even I was the consultant for this uh, Jakkur Lake uh, as well as this Rachanali Lake and all. For each and every item, we got tested in the laboratory. And after that only, it is say that whatever may be the permissible limit, what is the actual limit? And those actual uh, limits are within permissible or not. And there are many codes. IS 456 has given, the 2000 has given in page 15, what are the limits? But later, the 3025, uh, 3, part 1, part 2, part 3, 25, 32 parts are being given. What should be the quality? And also we are working with, even if anyone wants to bring those water, uh, what is that? Uh, we construct, what is that? Cubes. And we are doing the compressive strength and we calculate. If not, we can add some admixture. So like that, our all PhD were students are working on this only. Their PhD is only on admixtures, <laughs> go for new, new mixtures and find the strength and uh, increase the whether it is tensile, even fiber reinforcement, all those things, these are already there. And BIS is also working with us. No? So, so for these limits, these are the possibilities already available. And even in uh, Kaban Park, Kaban Park, STP is there. And that water only they are using for our irrigate the whole plants and all. So I went for that water balance. So what is the consumption of your plants? What they have done is how much water they are using from STP. They are not calculating what is the actual output transpiration, how many actual plants are there, what is the real demand is there. That means already it is when it is suitable for that, the construction also for curing also already limits are there. Only thing is whichever water they are using, they have to get tested, get certified whether it is suitable or not. Even in 2010, I went to Atibele. Atibele is uh, upstream of Sarjapur. Before this BWSB uh, plan of diverting wastewater to Kolar, these farmers joined and they say that, sir, we have lost so many bore wells and our so many bore wells have got dried. 
It means we lost so much of money. We will fund for this water instead of diverting the water. Please pump this water to our lakes for irrigation purpose. So they are doing tanker irrigation. When? Before initiation of this. When I contacted one brainstorming section with BWSSB as well as farmers. But that doesn't materialize. Finally, this water has been diverted to Kolar. Means all probabilities are available. Everything and permissible limits also there. But even if you are using portable water, you have to certify and you have to conduct those compressive strength of the required cement aggregate and all. And if it is within the suitable limits, you have to use it. So already it is in use. That's what I want to say there. Thank you. I would, I would like to, we, we talked about uh, economics, we talked about, and I would like to stick a little bit with this idea of having a code and also quality. Uh, Ganesh, when I bring my car to the repair, I want this to be a really good mechanic, but actually my car knows before I bring it to the repair person, what the problem is and the repair person also plugs in the little uh, plug into my car before he or she uh, does the mechanical work H how much how much benefit is there or how much possibility and opportunity is there in having smarter systems uh, in terms of quality is it bringing in samples which with with these 2000 uh, stps i mean that's a lot of samples and a lot of transporting samples are there smarter approaches for this so uh, I come from semiconductor industry and uh, I've been in water because there's an opportunity to solve it. So that context, I would say, I believe just like how water as a liquid is transparent and clear. What if you make the data of water transparent and clear? Can you solve the problem of water? Uh, I mean, if you see all the uh, digital technologies that you have seen, whether all the consumption of digital tools that you use, it's done the same thing for all, whether it's entertainment, gaming, or uh, retail, or this one. I believe the same can apply for water, which is a scarce resource. So one is, yes, I mean, uh, how do you know the exactly the water system is working or not? So that's where digital system helps to make sure that whether certain way the uh, treatment plant or various uh, bore well or whatever you call in the water infrastructure. Easiest way to know is uh, whether it is working according to certain uh, uh, this one pattern. That is possible through digital technology. As uh, Syed Kajasa said, like how he had seen the calculator, which was very expensive many years back, it is coming down. Today, I mean, today the same calculator that he bought would have got, we would have got at one by hundred the price, uh, including the. So, because of hundreds of digital transformation and smart city project, the whole monitoring, quality monitoring, or whether it is IoT system, all those things is coming down. It is becoming very commoditized. So, with that trend in place and the fact that the water crisis only is becoming high, there's an inflection point for why the water monitoring is very important today, right? So, so like for example, if you if your your water treatment uh, actually goes uh, has a downtime in two months time, what will do you do with that water treatment plant? You have to transport that untreated water to somewhere else to treat it, right? In order to be so is it possible to actually uh, get a predictive analytics on whether you, if this plant is going to go for a toss, right? So that is possible, right? When you actually track the entire water infrastructure, whether it is flow level, pressure, quality, uh, whether it's PS, TDS, all the parameter uh, beater, then you basically are tracking its performance over a period of time. And today we have uh, algorithms, which is anomaly detection, forecasting or federated learning, which comes from your uh, artificial intelligence directly applicable to so identify this downtime in advance. So the intersection of technology, whether it is artificial intelligence or uh, internet of things, or these things can actually be able to uh, help you predict this anomalies in advance and forecast the possibility and some way uh, take the overall satellite imagery of the possibility of a drought or a flood and make right decision. You can build a decision model using this. Now imagine all the water treatment plant in uh, a city is connected through a cloud infrastructure, secure cloud infrastructure, of course. 
then possibly you'll be ha having a platform to even trade water or share water and also make sure that how do you manage this during the time of drought uh, do, do you can actually build mechanism to uh, take water within a localized geography than actually putting water tankers from going from south bangalore to north bangalore so my belief is that uh, the digital technology is ready for this and the price has uh, is slowly coming down and this is going have to put a expensive hardware today a lot of computation happens at the cloud at a remote place because of the uh, pooling of uh, computation resources the price is going to, going to further come down to achieve some of this uh, requirements in the industry yeah well thank you ganesh so so i mean what you are describing is the cost of hardware is going down the cost of information transfer is going down i mean the challenge for us will still be to have useful sensors that actually help in the operation, just like in the example with the car repair. The way that you also, you've described it is, it's a dynamic situation. It's not that you have a plant and then from then on, it, it keeps going by itself, but you need to keep a tap on it. You need to keep a tap on also resources that are needed from this. Maybe I would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Sevarasu. So you have a background in green building and I think one of the great ways of moving green buildings forward is the green building standard. So to what extent is this model of a green label useful for this market of STPs? Because I mean, green building, you have certain requirements and you meet them. And once you put it up, you put a plaque on your building, which is completely in contrast to this dynamic situation. So can we learn from the green building standard also for this question of water management in buildings? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, as I said in the beginning, none of the green building councils across the globe, I was part of World GBC, traveled to various countries and uh, setting up the standard. None of them are developing standard or code as a policy. Uh, they only refer to the standard which is available which, and they do the test whether that standard and codes are working and whichever code standards are best globally, they will apply to the standard or green building um, guidelines. So that is a bottleneck right now. Since there is no code available or standard for use of treated wastewater for construction, and none of the standard, be it Green Star in um, Australia, or LEED in USA, CASPI in uh, Japan, India, IGBC, Griha, none of them are referee. Okay. That's what I said, unless otherwise the government agencies like the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, we need a body who can develop the standards and code, then very easily we can ask this council to adopt it. Unless however, that standard comes, nothing can be done. Now we have uh, all the green building codes and our green building councils globally. They talk about operational energy and water performance. We have a beautiful standard per capita energy consumption, per capita water consumption. Water fixers are really fixed in terms of uh, the flow and plus fixtures and quality of wastewater required, where to use, what kind of monitoring required, what kind of irrigation system is required. Those stuffs are very clearly written. I, I can give a simple example that we are working with one of the large development, 3.5 million square feet in Chennai, and they want to make it net zero water mm -hmm. for the construction purpose. The two bottlenecks, I've been working with them for the last one year, not able to find a solution. One is, I think most of you are aware that embodied water consumption. Okay, I can build a beautiful building and say my consumption is too little kiloliter per square meter at the end, maybe I'll go for a dry wall or um, precast concrete to reduce the water consumption. But ultimately, when it is produced, how much has been consumed? I think that is a major bottleneck what we have. So embodied water consumption, even embodied energy is not available. Uh, we are working with a lot of international agency to bring that embodied energy component for India, globally not available for uh, various reasons. I think that one part, maybe actually like uh, companies should work on it. It will become late tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'll have a beautiful building, less consumed water, but they would have spent huge water 
for producing a product, then we call it as a water efficient building. Second, for the same building where we need to get around 400 uh, cubic meter of water, excess water required to operate, make it net zero water. Nobody commits, there are sources around nobody commits consistency in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. We are not approaching normal uh, RWA or government bodies. We approached five star hotels and large uh, campus, but they said we will give, but we will not assure you that it's a tertiary standard. You can use it for construction and operation. I think this is where the issue, the quality of water, quantity is enormous. Okay, if you map it, you will get it in next door uh, step. The quality and consistency, that's where the metering comes. We need to have an online meter sooner or later. It will become too late. Tomorrow the distribution happens. Governments puts the mandatory that you need to have treated wastewater usage for construction purpose. Then people will be on the road. Online monitoring. Just imagine that uh, you have a central effluent treatment plan or STP. The treated water, base water, you can have online system there as a secondary uh, information. From there, cloud-based or IoT, whoever takes the water, that displays in their laptop. laptop. So simple. Mm -hmm. Connect it. So every, every day yeah. online, you see whether you are getting the required quality or not. Not necessary that as a construction agency, I need to do the quality test in my construction site. Why not online? Use the IT revolution and do it. I think this where the things has to evolve in this country sooner else it become a major issue okay thank you chair you need to tell me what to do yes. i want to make a small rejoin, very quick one can i interrupt the panel for just i just yes. want to introduce the member secretary who's online and, and then we'll come back to the questions uh shashank maybe you can So I just wanted to uh, uh, introduce Mr. Shini Vasalu, member secretary of the Pollution Control Board. He's an IFS officer from the 1997 batch, and he's currently serving as the member secretary of the Pollution Control Board. His Indian Forest Service began at Nagarholi National Park, and he went on to work in Bengaluru Rural and uh, Mysore, Kalaburgi, Kopala, and Chitradurga districts. Mr. Shini Vasalu is a distinctive person who has always advocated the preservation of wildlife and the environment. He brought in new measures which benefited the lives of tigers during his tenure as the director of Tiger Project at Dandeli's Kali Tiger Reserve. His documentary on the river Kali garnered the attention of wildlife lovers all over. Few segments of the documentary were released by the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the COP21 summit meeting held at Paris. He's an exceptional officer who has involved himself to the cause in a very special way. Uh, Mr. Srinivasalu, I just uh, hope you've been listening to the session and I think we've had a lot of insights. We would love to hear a few words from you. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, I'm, I'm audible. Yes, you are audible, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, But unfortunately, when Bangalore is flooded with surplus water, maybe this is not the right time to discuss about how sewage water or treated water usage should be improved, strengthened, or considered. Nevertheless, I think the, 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 the topic of uh, usage of treated water is very important and then we should uh, focus it. Now, coming back to that, uh, I really wonder uh, because Bangalore SCT that is bustling with around 131 uh, million people every day receives nearly 1500 MLD water from TK Heli. So much of energy is spent, so much of money is spent to pump water from an altitude of 700 meters to an altitude of 920 meters. And uh, 
I take Bangalore for all practical purpose as the water tank of Karnataka, because we all know simply that uh, if water is in my uh, ground level sink, I will not get water in my tap. I'll get water only when my over a tank is full. So Bangalore is over a tank for Karnataka because it is at the highest elevation. Now, every day we uh, Bangalore generate around 1440 mld sewage, of which though we have around 1000 mld capacity of sewage treatment, but we all can imagine though vehicle can run at 150 km per speed, but if road is not able to, uh, you know, providing that um, logistics, the vehicle will not go. So similarly, though we have that installed capacity, but our operation capacity is maybe 60 to 70% of that. Today, the stats say, official data says, around 600 MLD of treated water is used here and there in Chikbalapur, Kolar and other things, and it is one of the best initiatives. That leaves us every day around 800 MLD of sewage, 50% untreated and 50% treated official and as per official record, he is entering into our water bodies. And uh, we all know water is very precious life supporting system, but if water is not managed properly, it can threaten lives, it can threaten livelihoods, and even it can threaten civilization, as is evident in history. Okay, so water management, especially in urban centers, becomes very important. Now I'm looking at from two different perspectives. One, uh, trying to concentrate on usage of treated water from RWS, where the number is many and quality issues, many people are telling and then many people are concentrating on putting IoT cloud kind of a thing. In fact, I had a meeting with Kai called with the tanker wallas just to link there is a platform that can you know serve as ola uber you know platform where somebody need water and then somebody has treated water so we try to push it there but again the people sitting here i think we should look at the macro issues where <clears throat> every day see for we all know welfare governments do anything and everything to provide water you know Ethinella project, what is in simply to put it, we are planning to spend around 12,000 crores to get 24 TMC water from 250 kilometers away to provide water to Tumkur, Chitradurga, these area districts. These days, we also hear another project, Make a Datu, where 9,000 crores is planning to be spent to get around 4.5 TMC water to quench the thought of Bangalore. Now, 1,000 million liters per day sewage is available in Bangalore. We all know uh, tertiary treatment is a established technology and it is possible. The cost is around 2.5 to 3 crore per MLD of tertiary treatment. That to say, if I spend around 2,500 to 3,000 crores, I should be getting 1,000 million liters of near portable quality water at 920 meters high in Bangalore, which I, if I have a plan of proper secondary distribution network, either for, you know, for my parks or for my, you know, avenue plantation or for raising forest and you know, horticulture nurseries, nurseries for major constructions. It could be metros or it could be you know, rail here and there. And some speakers here and there were mentioning the issues of quality. You know, but you know, I'm, I'm placing it on record. Uh, in fact, we had called a lot of builders during that uh, meeting to interact between Tankerwala and then builders to say, are you using uh, you know, treated water for uh, building purpose? Everybody were telling yes. That means major builders they have their own, you know, STPs where uh, still they are the, uh, they are maintaining those uh, properties. There, the treated water, they are confident of using the treated water in their own projects. So, so, technology is there, opportunity is there, only confidence building measure here and there is missing. So, if we concentrate on building this confidence building measure, especially at major sources, 
especially at BWSSB bigger plants where from one plant if majority of treated water could be supplied to as i was telling for this agriculture purpose irrigation purpose ground water then i know road uh, dust uh, maintenance or i know uh, major infrastructure things then today uh, bwss we have is supplying water to international airport i you know at, at a cost of around you know 1 rupee per liter as you know tanker uh, criss cross different uh, residential welfare associations to provide our supplement water the cost is anywhere between 25 paise per liter to 50 paise per liter that means okay we have the potential of generating even revenue of 90 to 190 to 450 crore every year just by ensuring the treated water is used for secondary purposes and whatever so called we valley lake pollution everything automatically will be addressed this is a additional benefit because you know, the untreated sewage that is entering into these lakes is a major source of lake pollution so this will be an additional benefit <clears throat> now one more benefit is even there is always a public perception ki matlab these stps are not operating the, the water quality is not good the moment we ensure the treated water is reused by some uh, agency when you are getting revenue that itself will answer if all those critics who are you know criticizing the quality of water is not good or treated water stp is not operating so we we are sitting in a win win situation where we have sewage assured sewage we have technology you know where cost is not very much unlike majority of those irrigation projects that we think of and by simple gravity we should be able to irrigate the arid districts in and around bangalore just by using treated water from bangalore this will add up confidence building measure among public that you know our stps and then everything is operated it will solve our lake pollution water pollution problems so we are we have so many positives to take from just by one initiative of invest and even you know, have a perspective plan to use these treated sewage for secondary purposes or industrial purposes and then various other purposes that we are looking at that so this is a great opportunity uh, that we should be encashing and uh, the scientific community community where we are discussing here uh, i think you know we should uh, through regulatory bodies like kspcb should build up a momentum at the at the you know local level or uh, you know at at uh, you know, a public domain where the the you know sewage water treatment in bangalore should not be seen as you know anti pollution control measure no let it be seen as the measure that provide supplement potable water to bangalore because see you know kaveri 1 2 3 4 4 4 5 6 these are all water these are measures to quench thirsty thirst of bangalore and the welfare governments do anything and everything to do providing water so maybe by changing our narrative of use of treated water as a anti pollution control measure or you know, as a welfare measure if this initiative is seen as a measure to provide water to bangalore as well as provide water to arid districts surrounding bangalore the governments and public should take it you know on uh, you know, a platter and in fact i also look for the you know uh, the, the resource persons here sitting here even to move about you know think about uh, you know out of the box ideas wherein why not even private players should not be invited you know invited here for example just see me maybe some uh, you know 20 years back when we were traveling from chitradurga to bangalore we were moving on you know single lane road but then the private players entering the scene building up road and then collecting road tax for next 10 15 years to realize their money similarly why not here allow private players to come and put up tertiary treatment plants and get you know some agreement with bwssb here and there only assured sewage and 
and you know opportunity for them to provide treated water to you know, people who are in demand there are players there are people so and uh, for next 10 15 years by selling water they should be able to recover their money this is a great opportunity for uh, you know, bangalore at the city and uh, this topic of so uh, initiating or exploring use of treated water uh, is is a very good initiative let us expand this initiative from technological discussion or uh, you know it related uh, discussion to practical commercial uh, commercially viable venture models so that you know, people will join players will join and uh, the purpose for which we are uh, initiating the dis- discussion gets into logical end okay i am seriously looking for that uh, that you know we are journey and i'm so happy that this discussion at least initiate all the different players who are involved in uh, this sector uh, get at least uh, you know educated informed or even made aware that this is technically possible legally you know, possible and more than more over everything is economically viable and environmental friendly also and i am i am very happy that this discussion uh, of uh, today on uh, usage of treated water especially in bangalore will give us good results and then i am very happy to share these few thoughts with uh, everybody here and it was a very interesting and useful discussion thank you thank thank you so much sir um we we definitely will take your feedback on board and focus on an economically viable model that can actually be implemented in the market and i think that we have a lot of new entrepreneurs here in our uh, who were in our first panel uh, that you mentioned that we really hope can help to scale uh, so we just have a small token of our appreciation which i don't know if you can see or not but it's a book that we thought will be close to your heart on the sahay adris so we will drop it off in your office uh, yeah, soon yeah. oh uh, said <laughs> said sir said that he will uh, mr khaja sir said, said said that he will carry it for you he's he's also uh, over here thank you so much thank you so what what do we do is there the transition now to so ever had i think we can continue uh, the panel because you were at a very interesting juncture i think mr shah had something to say so we can pick up where we left off if uh, i think that we got some more insights and po- potentially some okay. more questions yeah. so we can go on till 4 o'clock if you ask me but maybe maybe it's we can go as long as people's stomachs permit them yeah, so you, you should control that time so i mean because it's an, it is, can, it can is. i can i poll from the audience how how hungry is everyone and how much time are you going to give eberhard and the rest of the panelists here maybe 10 more minutes or so 10 minutes yeah yeah okay thank you uh yeah uh, i saw a lot of energy around green building so i just wanted to you know bring the water context uh, and green building and talk about an example that we have done which is working very well for green building for iapmo and for the users of this green building and maybe there is some inspiration there to and learn from there for this one so igbc uh, iapmo developed a standard for water efficiency it is called water efficient products of india wepi standard it was uh, launched in 2013 2017 it was refreshed now what happens is that any uh, green building uh, can be certified green building only if the taps flushes all the water consuming devices used in that green building are certified as water efficient products so all the major manufacturers who want to supply the taps to these green buildings they have to necessarily take a iapmo certification for wepi only then that they will be able to supply so there is a entire thing the suppliers the manufacturers of taps have to meet the criteria and green building have to have that so everything is plugged in and therefore there is no other choice but to use uh, certified products 
if this can be as an inspiration to think about this kind of a water for use in green building maybe there is something there we add one small thing for a 10 second uh, in fact uh, now we have globally we have a green uh, certification for cities villages communities rwas so things are there unfortunately the standard set codes are not there to plug in if this comes automatically things will happen i should mention that uh, just last week uh, one of our customer is a hospital g g kupus fine swami ha on naidu hospital in coimbatore it's you know coimbatore is a very so they actually got the platinum rating in uh, leeds rating uh, lead uh, both us and indian gbc and when i first met the ceo of the hospital uh, his words were exactly this he told ganesh uh, we are here to heal not to harm the environment so you know hospitals so it was very powerful from his vision point of view from his there to heal to today to actually get the first hospital healthcare facility in the entire country to get a platinum rating so i think this is definitely a powerful means to uh, encourage people uh, towards eco friendly and more people like to go to the hospital because they know that it's purely in the vision of the hospital is to heal so such narrative has to actually go out more <laughs> when i like to add here since i am in this industry for last 20 years uh water use reduction achieved in operational facilities uh, it's almost close to 50% after introduction of uh, green rating globally not only in india but uh, if you look at um, the other side of the same coin construction no impact nothing has happened almost close to zero that means 15 years we have been working on operational efficiency but this side nothing has happened that is really uh, alarming situation for the country and if this continues imagine nothing is going to happen for next 5 to 10 years it's going to be a major issue i think this is the good that we started talking about it a lot of work needs to be done not only in india i am talking about even abroad this area has not really looked upon at large scale uh sir 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 for you <clears throat> actually i am a member of bis in delhi uh, who is uh, bhanu prakash is the director they created a separate branch water resources in that quality now they we want to have a one unit in university with water institute if you people are interested to come up with this we can come up with a bis standards now or we can have one program as a bs standards particularly for construction industry we can do that hmm? that is there already it is there because we are already a part of the pisp as a member for water resources and second major problem is the special distribution of water so you can see that even the flooding is in the so that is non space non space means distribution is not uniform so import even ground water is we have to monitor and it is a quantity quantity of availability of water the places where gr even ground water is not available those people are 100% ready to use any water so it is important is quantification spatial distribution that has to be map properly to use economically the available water that's it
So, uh, in fact, uh, I come from the Indian Institute of Science. I did my master's there, and a couple of years after I, I did my master's, I came to know there is a center for uh, nano science that was inaugurated. It is more than now for ten years. So, when I go to the department, I see. An amazing development happening in the department in terms of sensors. I, I can vouch that these sensors will get commercialized. Uh, I mean, they have all kinds of uh, technology, which is one of the highest investment done in Asia at an institution level for the semiconductor sensor uh, manufacturing. So yeah, the thing is, we should have that patience to see this all this thing come into light. Uh, but I do believe the early adopters will also help in making sure uh, more such technology. I mean, when you see early adopters, uh, especially the premium consumers of water, use this technology and showcase the feasibility, then the market will automatically build. So, uh, or uh, I mean, without market, many system would not come, right? So that's where I think uh, uh, courage is required by especially the large guzzlers of water and uh, uh, some of the premium apartments uh, should also consider uh, being a, this one, first take the step, even if the cost today might be expensive, but they're actually building the industry, building the market. I actually have a question for uh, Dr. Eberhard. <laughs> So um, it's related to sensors, but I think uh, we very into, uh, we assume that sensors can give us accurate depiction of water quality. But we do know that certain parameters are, it's not just the cost that's an issue. It's also the technology is, uh, it, it would be a whole host of systems, not a compact sensor that you can just have in decentralized units that tell you that the water is safe for all reuses. Um, you were mentioning that you know upstream sensors are important to know how the system is operating. I was just wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about that and what your views on sensors becoming integrated into a dashboard for quality are. There's a couple of aspects. So when it comes to uh, the construction industry and sulfate and chloride, I mean, there are sensors available and that's easy and it's a direct measurement. Uh, when it comes to safety, uh, hygiene, uh, protecting people, but also protecting the environment, some of the aspects cannot be directly measured. It cannot even be directly measured in the laboratory, some of the, 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 uh, 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 the pathogens that are affecting us. So I think you gave, Ganesh actually gave two answers that I really like. One is, well, maybe there is some smart sensor coming up uh, in the future, but I doubt it that we will have all of the uh, the, the, the parameters that we need monitor. But you gave another answer earlier where you said, well, how about if we do pattern recognition? I mean, we know how the pumps are turning on, we know how things are operating. So smart sensors are not necessarily always looking at the individual contaminants, but they need to look closer into the operation of the system. And maybe that brings me back to my, my very first statement, and I hope I, I, I was not mis misunderstood. I said, the systems should be as simple, as cheap, as robust, as is fit to the task. And I think the question that we need to ask ourselves, so what does fit to the task mean? Does it mean we simply have systems that run by themselves and if they work, that's fine. If they don't work, that's also fine, 95% uh, of the time. Or do we have our standards and we say, no, we need a little bit more smartness. So it doesn't mean high tech and spending more money all the time, but thinking what would be the relevant information that we can ensure that the end user, whether it's construction industry that we focus quite a bit of, uh, on, but it's also the residents. I mean, if we only make the construction happy, uh, 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 industry happy, but forget about environment and residents, then I think this nice link that we are developing here uh, has, has some downsides. After sensors or not to monitor safety when it comes to reuse of uh, uh, treated water? Uh, well, Do we have the sensors or not? Well, we have the PhD student, Eva, who will, who will provide you the answer to this. The answer is uh, we have the ability to, to tell you whether your system is working safely. If you give me a bucket of water and tell me, well, stick in the sensor and tell me whether, it work, whether this is safe or not, we, have, we don't have it, we will not get it. But if, if uh, we have the sensors in your plant and we feel the pulse of the patient, the STP, then yes, we can give an answer on yes, it's safe. So it's, it's a, I, I wish I could give you a simple, short, yes, no answer. And here's the sensor that I can sell you, but this is not possible, unfortunately. 
So Abhahad, correct me if I'm wrong. We have a sensor that can test the system, but not really give you quality of the end product holistically. Is that right? Uh, yes, and testing the system. So we need to have enough. We need to have a good system upstream. I don't, I think it came up. If we have horribly working systems and then we throw sensors at them, this is a waste of resources. Um, so, but if we have robust systems where we know how they work and we're basically monitoring the performance of the individual steps, well, then we know that, that the water is safe. But we need to also understand the different steps that are involved in this. So it's not a black box sensor that you just stick into your system. Wherein, you know, because I think the sensor technology is evolving very fast. And as you said, it's becoming cheaper also. So one could uh, take a sample of say 10 STPs, deploy them, and then there is a laboratory analysis of those and comparative analysis of what the sensor is telling and publish a kind of a report that says that, okay, there is this level of accuracy precision uh, in these sensors. And that may be a confidence building measure. So also two, two aspects. So Aifa, she's here for five months trying to uh, start with exactly this. So, so we have cheap sensors that are relevant that, that could be deployed. And we have the super expensive sensors that we uh, uh, deploy side by side to get an understanding. So you ask, a, you ask the relevant question. We're still in the process of, of doing. Yeah. Well, so, so. Yeah, but let, 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 let me, let me bring, let, let, heated discussion, I like that. So let's bring those two arguments together. So I don't believe that this sensor, you have a, a, a bad treatment system, a bad operator, and the sensor will not make it work. But I think what you've also mentioned, so it takes the whole value chain, it takes the education of the operator. If the operator is not a good operator, it, I mean, it takes, you have to treat your operator as well. That's what we discussed yesterday. So it takes this, it takes good technology, it takes the whole value chain. I think it doesn't work that you say, I invest only in one part. If you only train the operators and you have bad systems, it's not going to work. If you have good systems and bad operators, it's not going to work. And the same is true for, for the sensing. It's just part of this, but I think it's worth uh, expanding beyond having, well, a, a robust system, an operator, and let's hope for the best. Okay, so the, uh, the, the lunch part is uh, not working, but that's okay. Yeah, I mean, so uh, there's always sensors cost will, take, it, it will come down. Uh, we have to know the graph over a period of time. But the thing is, you can also do time division multiplexing of some sensors, and mm -hmm. that is possible today through drones, right? I mean, it's not possible to actually put all the sensors elsewhere. So there's a possibility that you can have a drone that can collect this water data because we have a very good drone policy in the country today, right? So we have to, ha in order to go through this transition of becoming getting the lowest cost sensor over a period of time, there should be intermediary steps. I believe uh, water data collecting from drones to actually from apartment to apartment and say collecting at one location and then probably it's possible. Uh, I mean, ha having run a drone company in the past, I, I believe <laughs> this is possible. <laughs> okay, so last comment. Yeah, uh, I'm not an expert on sensor, sorry, but still I can give a comparison on the sustainability part. When we built the first green building as a test pit in uh, I had a bit, I was a consultant. Uh, we spent 25% more. Not only control, overall construction and import of product. Now, after, now that is built in 2002, now the construction cost is going up not beyond 2%. Where is 25%, where is 2%? I think one answer for this is a market transformation. Once the demand comes, Codes and standards demand that you need to have this, this automatically take place. Even if you look at control, now I have a sensor for lighting, which controls the movement, daylight and occupancy count. We come to that level. 
Okay, earlier there was a lot of reluctance in adopting sensors for air conditioning and lighting. We were struggling that mandatory in ASHRAE. And uh, after implementation, a lot of innovators in this country, we, they started producing it. Now we have everything indigenized in the country. If that is happen in energy, why not in water? It's a matter of time. The stakeholders should be effectively involved in the process, including private and government. The demand goes up, the sensor will be easily available. Technology is not a major issue in this country. Constraint is market transformation and adoption and testing. Okay, so I think this is a nice way. I don't know how to make the transition, but I think the transition will lead us towards lunch now. There is a heated discussion going on. I think it's, it's really about value. If we just put in sensors and we have no value, then it's wasted money. But, but if your operator feels, hey, uh, I, have a, I can do things better, more efficiently, have better quality. And that's, that's really a tough nut to crack. So the cost is one aspect of the sensors, but the getting real information that is helping to make better decisions. I think that's really what we will discuss over lunch. Okay. Thank you. It's for you. Uh, I would like to inform you that uh, he may be aware, Sohel. Uh, we have made it mandatory for the um, green building certification beyond certain uh, level of projects. Uh, that is uh, two lakh square feet and above. We have made it mandatory uh, in Karnataka. And we have also sent a representation to the government to give some incentives in terms of uh, taxation and all that. I don't know whether they will accept because it has got a financial implication, but this is already made. Now I want uh, you know Kredai to circulate among your builders. Like he said, it cost less than 2% now to go from regular building to green building. Thank you. Yeah, I like to add this. I am the implementing agency for Karnataka. This notification has been done but the implementation committee is not ready. We are struggling for last two years. So set the committee for monitoring. Right now there is no committee. It's a notification, it's a mandatory, but not on the ground. Just, uh, just I like to inform you. We have, I have met uh, energy secretary, then uh, uh, urban development secretary. Things are happening at, this is the only state where notification happened two years back implementation not started, unfortunately. If that comes, only the builder will adopt. Right now, it is on the paper. Okay, so let's thank our panel members again. And then final words will come from you. Yes, fine. Um, I think the final words will come from everyone. I just wanted to thank everyone again for uh, the three days that you participated and giving up your valuable time. Uh, thank you, guys. And we hope that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.